Hello there. How are you doing, Skip? Good. How are you? Not doing too bad. Yeah, nice to see you. Tell me how your name is pronounced. <laughs> it's always a tough one. Uh, it's Adon. Adon, okay. Adon, yeah, yeah, yeah. Irish name. Yeah, I have um, three Irish American grandchildren. No uh, way. Yeah. Um, uh, Aveline, Killian, and Searsha. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, the whole, the whole fucking brigade, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm familiar with Irish names. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, we, we, have, we have that. We have that. And the, the time zones, man. Two, two great things starting off. <laughs> oh, that is great because uh, last night I was reading the Bhagavad Gita until one o'clock in the morning. And for my reading partner, it was morning time for her, eight to nine in the morning. But for me, it's late at night. So That's so... I saw the, the streams going live on your channel. And like, tell me a little bit more about that, how you read into the night. And, and how did all this start even? Well, and why the Bhavagad Gita? All right, I can uh, actually show you why. Okay. Uh, I, even, okay. I even have been keeping it on my screen lately. Okay, so you're familiar with the Red Book of, of Carl Jung, right? I am you know, familiar. You know it exists anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is page... 154 of the Red Book. And since that, that's hard to read, up next to Philemon there. Uh, Philemon, that's it. Yeah, this is, this is Philemon. And so I'm going to read it to you out of the Bhagavad Gita. What it says in two verses of the Bhagavad Gita is, whenever there is a de decay of righteousness and a growth of unrighteousness, I incarnate myself, O descendant of Bharata. I reincarnate across the ages in order to give protection to the righteous and to destroy the unrighteous for the reinstatement of righteousness. So who's talking there is um, Krishna, mm. who is a, a manifestation of Vishnu. Now, the reason that's significant is Jung said throughout his life that he would he had to leave hints bef behind because he couldn't talk about some things. They were just too much to talk about in his time. Mm. And um, so we interviewed um, a Jungian analyst in April named Ashok Beatty. And of course, I have a lot of experience in Asia, more than 10 years worth. And, but in all that time, uh, I haven't looked back at the, at Indian mythology per se. Okay, I, I've had a little bit of interest in Ganesha and a couple of other things like that. But, um, but I had never looked at the Bhagavad Gita since I graduated from college. And um, what did you do in college you know, just to get, get a picture there? Well, I studied history. Okay, okay. Beautiful. And, um, and it was mainly Asian history that I studied, but not, it was mainly China and Japan. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't the subcontinent. Mm. And, and so, um, so I probably had in, in, Oriental philosophy or something like that, some mention of the Bhagavad Gita, but I haven't looked at it since college, so that's over 50 years now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so he mentioned it, and he actually mentioned that quote, and he said that, you know, he, he ex fully expects uh, a modern manifestation of Vishnu, and he also said uh, the next manifestation of Vishnu may be a woman. So that was all well and good. So I, that got me thinking, well, geez, I probably ought to look at the Bhagavad Gita. So I ordered uh, two copies, and one of them was this one, which is the, um, uh, which is the uh, Penguin class Classic. 
It's actually not the best one. The gold standard is this one um, by, with Les Morgan and Carol Pitts, R.K. RK Sharma's translation. Um, and the reason for that is that Les Morgan has written a companion book for that, which is called A Study Guide to the Bhagavad Gita by Les Morgan, okay? who also was the editor-in-chief of the R.K. Sharma translation. Okay, so, so I ordered these two books, and um, I think only one of them came on May the 9th. And the way I handle a new book is I normally just open it to and see what comes to me, because that very often leads to some sort of synchronicity. And so what I opened it to by coincidence or by synchronicity was the 10th discourse, verse 19. And in that discourse, from that point on, Krishna is d describing who he is. And it actually hits me over the head because let me see if I can. Uh, um, Vishnu now, yeah. Krishna is a is a manifestation of Vishnu, and in right. those in these texts, um, where in the world is this, and why is this book significant? Well, okay, so so I'm about to tell you that. So beautiful. In verse twenty, it says, "I am the self," and the self is the most fundamental archetype in Jungian psychology. Okay, so then I read on in that discourse and oh my God, uh, it's, it's a description of the self, a, a partial description of the self because the, the self is not, you can't just pin it down, right? It, it's, but it's much bigger than that. Uh, but that's pretty big. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, just to give you a, a sense of it, let's see. Um, uh, among weapons, I am the thun thunderbolt. Among cows, I am the wish-granting cow. I am Kardapa, who makes progeny. Among serpents, I am their king, the Suki. Among horses, I am Indra's horse. Recognize me to be born of nectar. Among great elephants, I am Indra's Aravata. And among men, I am their protector. And um, so the self archetype in Jungian psychology amounts to <clears throat> our instinctual nature. Okay. And it's something that has been given to us by evolution for um, three and a half billion years, mm. ever since single-celled organisms. And all of our ancestors, going all the way back to single-celled organisms, and we all have ancestors like that, um, have done two things successfully. They've survived until they reproduced, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? And if there had ever been a break in that chain, you and I wouldn't exist. <clears throat> and so, and that's a lot of chance happenings, millions of them over time. <clears throat> but anyway, the self keeps us alive fundamentally um, in many ways, many unconscious ways. It tells our heart to beat 72 times a minute, for example our lungs to breathe 12 times a minute. We never think about that, but nonetheless, the self is doing the work and it never fails us, mm. <laughs> right? Until we're, until we're dead. That's interesting how you, how you, you kind of, you look, looking at the self at a, at a biological angle. It's like, I would really think about it only psychologically in my, in my readings of it. Whereas, you know, I really think about it as the, as the duality perfected? Uh, yeah, well, at the deepest level, the self is one thing. 
Mm. Right. Uh, <clears throat> duality is how we have psychic energy. Okay. Mm. It's only because of duality that we have energy going back and forth between the two opposites. <clears throat> and we have thousands of those all operating at the same time. And so, um, so dual duality provides us with psychic energy. Mm. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. I guess I phrased that wrong is as in like the self is, is the male and the female of our psyches kind of meeting. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what I meant there. That, that's an interesting as well. The, the, du the duality side of things is uh, an idea that I've been really interested in recently is um, an antiodromia. Yeah. Well, everything will tend to turn into its opposite, right? Yeah. E equals MC squared, right? How does that come into it? Well, everything is either mass or energy. Okay. Another book I like very much right here, the Radiant Sutras. Uh, translated by Lauren Roach. He makes a great paragraph here. <clears throat> the re uh, wait a minute, that's not the one I wanted to read though. Wait a minute. <clears throat> okay. The Bhairava Tantra is set as a conversation between the goddess, who is the creative power of the universe, and the god who is consciousness that permeates everywhere. For short, they call each other Devi and Bhairava, Bhairava, Shakti and Shiva. They are lovers and inseparable partners, and one of their favorite places of dwelling is in the human heart. So the point is you can't have one without the other. It comes down to E equals MC squared. In a, okay. In a scientific sense. Mm. Right. Everything's either mass or energy, and it's it's constantly changing from one to the other at varying mm. at varying speeds. And an antiodromia is what causes that because if you're extreme, if you're on one extreme side of something, for example, if we take the political debate. Uh, today, if you're on either the red or the blue side, what you can be sure of is you're on your way back to the other side. <laughs> yes, the horseshoe. Well, it's it yeah. kind of bends back over to the other side eventually. Right, and you know the the funny thing is the what happens is they they change sides. So the the GOP claims. Uh, ownership of Abraham Lincoln um, because he was a Republican. However, uh, the two sides changed sides entirely in the 1960s. Mm. And, and so Abraham Lincoln didn't stand for anything that that is, uh, or very little that is in the white supremacist point of view, right? Mm which is on the GOP side. So, um, you know, these things are very complex, but uh, anyway, so tell me about yourself. Where, where are you? Where are you? What are you doing these days? Um, mm. Aside hanging out at home like the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I am currently situated in Toronto. Um, mm -hmm. I've been moved here from Ireland um, last September. Uh huh. Um, and yeah, what, so. what what part of Ireland? Galway, the west coast. Oh uh, ah, yeah, uh, I know Galway. Uh, no way. Uh, yeah, I, I've been um, a company I worked for used to have a production center in Loch Ray. Okay, yeah, very close, very interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, my um. I have been drunk in Galway. <laughs> All right. One night I was in the pub till four in the morning, I think it was. I think it closed at four. And I had to start to drive at six. Oh, uh, okay. Get to, to get to a flight in Dublin on at nine. <laughs> you, you, were, you were well on it, as they say. So, so just imagine um, 
driving drunk in the inside of a cow. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. That's how dark it was. Oh, man. Well, that was, I mean, that was a long while ago. That was back in 82 or so. Wow. Okay. Um, that's, that's very cool. But, um, yeah, I grew up, grew up in, a, in a Catholic Irish small town, wow. uh, rural Ireland. So um, that's, that's the background. Uh, and yeah, uh, my son-in-law is from Cork, Cork, well, Cork area. Okay. But literally, his wedding was in Ballinspital. Ballinspital. Yeah. <laughs> which which is, which is a, a suburb of Kinsale. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's it's funny that when when you're from a place it seems to be like this uh this this almost rule that uh less exploration happens if you're from the place yeah maybe uh, yeah yeah so, well that's from conversations but yeah I moved over to canada then last year just for some life experience um and uh yeah i've been working over here ever since um mm -hmm. since then and i am uh, in the process of uh completely changing careers and um studying going back to university to study so uh to, that's, to that's, study that's, what i'm going to study in psychology oh good okay yes that would be good yeah with the with the aim of get, uh, getting into clinical so um uh, 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 yeah yeah okay well uh, that'll be that'll be good just uh the one thing i would say to you is be sure you're comfortable with working with other people's problems mm. okay because that um i studied the law and i really liked going to law school very much mm. but when i ac got out actually uh studying the law or actually practicing law i detested it i really detested it and because uh, I was always dealing with other people's problems. Okay. And I, and I didn't care for that. And obviously, if you're in clinical psychology, you know, it just depends. If you're a young and you're going to spend an hour with a patient, but if you're if you're going under the under the uh, whatever it is, CBD, um, or you know, some health insurance plan that is wants you to just give people a drug mm. to solve their um, depression type thing and so they only give you 10 minutes yeah <laughs> uh you're gonna see a lot of patients and yes uh, and it's gonna be a lot of patients either way i mean either way whether it's 10 minutes or an hour uh you're gonna see a lot of patients and a lot of them are not very happy people so uh, mm. so you need to um, be sure be yeah yes for sure and, and yeah that, that is the yes something i've definitely thought about a lot um and it, it is the clinical it is the one-on-one the -on -one, um kind of pr practice that uh, that i'd uh, that i'm that i'd really like to do um but mm -hmm. of course there's lots of different angles that um, you can take um and i'm sure my interests will change uh, over my studies as well, so you you know you have to go where the where the where the spark of uh, divinity takes you. Amen. So so uh, you're going to start school in the fall, are you? That's it. Starting starting in the in the fall uh, back in Ireland, and we're going to take it from there. Apprehensive. Uh, so you're going to start in the fall in Ireland. Yes. Okay. So. Where are you going, Trinity, or where? Trinity, no, NUIG, it's on, on, in Galway there on the West Coast, um, National University of Ireland, Galway. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. good. And then we'll take it from there. Uh, the, I'll do, I'm doing the undergrad there. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, since moving out of Ireland, uh, you know, the world has opened up uh, psychologically. So I can, mm -hmm. uh, I, I can, I'm not, I'm willing to go anywhere, uh, to be honest. Mm -hmm. that. Well, they, these days, that's the right attitude to have because... Uh, the world is infinitely smaller than when I was your age. Um, yeah. You know, I went to Japan at age 15, and it was like going to the other side of the world. Or, or the, yeah. To the other side of the galaxy, maybe. <laughs> you know, it's like going to Mars. 
Um, oh, man. And, oh, uh, when was that? 1962. Japan in 1962. Man. Yeah. Well, do, you to, do you want to take us back and, and start off the, your, this so to, to get your story? It'll be, it'll be cool. Um, so, like, where, where are you from and where did it all begin? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, it all began in um, Biloxi, Mississippi. Uh, my father was a naval officer, and so he was stationed in at a CB base in um, Gulfport. And so I was born on what later became Keesler Air Force Base. At the time, it was an Army base, but it changed to the Air Force in 1947. Um, but uh, so I was born at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi, which, you know, for you being from Ireland and living in Toronto, you can't really appreciate that. But to give you an order of magnitude, the president of the Confederacy had his home between Biloxi and Gulfport. You can see it on the road. Okay. <laughs> and, and the state of Mississippi, within this week, has voted to remove the Confederate flag, which was a battle flag of the traitors, mm. <laughs> off their state flag for the first time after 150 years. 100 and yeah, 155 years since the end of of the Civil War. Mm. So um, that that's a special kind of the of the country. But in any case, I um, you know I grew up in the Navy, and and uh, because when I was two years old, I had a a problem with asthma. Um, my father got stationed on the Mojave Desert at one point for three years. Okay. And uh, that cleared up my asthma. It turns out it's just serious allergies <clears throat> these days. They didn't know what it was in those days. And um, so we lived on the, you know, first I lived in Norfolk, Virginia, then in uh, the Mojave Desert of California. Uh, and then uh, in Kodiak, Alaska, <laughs> and uh, and then in were you following your your father's um, career? Yeah, career. Okay. Yeah. So he was he was a supply officer. So I don't really know what he did in Gulfport, but in Norfolk he was a supply officer on a destroyer. And then in California, he was uh, the paymaster. That was his job, to pay everybody. Okay. And, and uh, then in Kodiak, he was the supply officer of the base. Uh, and what is the supply officer now? Well, the guy that makes sure you have bullets and beans, whatever, okay. you, whatever you need, the logistics of, of the Navy. Um, and so in Kodiak, it was a base logistics job, right? And so he got such wonderful things as uh, the novelist James Michener came up there because the commander of the base had been, uh, did you ever see the movie South Pacific? No. Nope. Okay, well, you might want to see that someday. It's a good movie, good stage play also, but in any case, uh, James Michener wrote um, a series of short stories called Tales of the South Pacific. And in it, one of the characters is this Captain Cratchit. <laughs> and Captain Cratchit was an actual person, but his name was actually Bird. And it, he was Admiral Bird when we were in Kodiak and he was the commander of the base. And so Michener, Com comes up there to visit uh, in, this is in the early 1950s, 52, 53. And uh, my father's task, they, they went out on a hunting party and they killed seven Kodiak bears, you know, these huge 
uh, brown bears. They're the biggest in the world. And my dad's job was to make sure that the brown bear skins got uh, cured and sent to Michener. I don't know what Michener was going to do with them, but that was the that was the deal. Okay. <laughs> so that's what a supply officer does. <laughs> okay. Quantum bears. So then um, we went to, he got stationed in Kalamazoo, Michigan, where Borg Warner had a factory. And they had a contract. <laughs> they had a contract to build Amtrak for the Marine Corps. It's an amphibious tractor. And they were building one a month. And so they're basically building them by hand, right? And so there were three naval officers stationed there. And their job was to be inspector of naval shipbuilding and inspect the construction of these Amtraks as they were built. And then from there, my father went on another ship out of Norfolk again, and we went to upstate New York to a town called uh, Casanova while he went overseas. The ship deployed to the Mediterranean. And um, later we moved to Norfolk with him when the ship came back in. And um, let's see, then from there, ah, so there I got involved in the, in the civil rights movement because and I was in the sixth grade. What age is that? Uh, about 10 or 11. Okay. So at age 10 or 11, um, I was going into junior high school I went through sixth grade there, and when I was to go into junior high school, the governor of Virginia decided to close all the schools in the state of Virginia in order to prevent blacks from going to public high schools or public schools at all. And he, he closed the schools for an entire year. <laughs> and... Um, it was really a dastardly thing to do, right? Mm. So we were out of school for a couple of months, and then the churches created sort of makeshift schools. And so we, I went to school in a church for a couple of months. And then my father had orders to go to Philadelphia to work on landing gear for the Navy, uh, arresting gear, which meant... Um, the nets that they put on aircraft carriers to keep airplanes from going over the side when they land to catch them, literally catch them. So <laughs> you've, you, you've moved multiple times by this in your life uh, already. So yeah. what, what was that like having to constantly say, make new friends, meet new people? Well, it was like, um, you know, it's not fun um, because People don't know who you are, and so I always would have to um, to just stay in the background, not participate very much until people got to know me. Mm. Uh, so that made me quite introverted. But usually after six months or so, then I would get more involved with the people in that community, and just about the time I would be getting comfortable, we'd move on. Yeah and started over again mm -hmm. and so um so an anyway that that was the process i went to 13 schools in 17 years um mm -hmm. and um uh, then from philadelphia we went to japan and i went to high school in japan starting when i was 15 years old and in that two and a half year period i never had a conversation by telephone with my grandparents, <laughs> not a single time. Um, okay. After I came were back they were, to- Were they ahead. significant in your life? 
at that time? Obviously, um, if you're... N no, not particularly because they were never around much. Okay. Right? Because we were moving all over the country and they were where we were. Mm. Um, but, um, you know, but neither did my parents. I mean, we wrote a few letters, but that was it. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so after I came back in my freshman year of college, uh, I was involved in an automobile accident at the thing, Thanksgiving holiday, our Thanksgiving holiday. And um, one of the kids, um, I was sitting in the back seat, fortunately, and one of the kids that was in the back seat with me was killed. Um, and the guy next to me had, the guy in the middle had his collarbone broken in two places and his pelvis broken in two places. And, um, and then there was me, and I was the only one that was still conscious after that accident and so um, I came back to to college and uh, the last day of school before the Christmas holiday my roommate and I drank a fifth of Johnny Walker in half an hour okay <laughs> and we're both lucky to I think I may only I, I may I think he may have died more recently, but I, I'm still at it <laughs> more than almost 60 years later. But, but, uh, that yeah, night, that fifth. night I thought I was going to die. <laughs> okay. And like a fifth now, uh, how big is that? Uh, well, and it's a what, fifth of a gallon. Fifth of a gallon. Okay. It, and and okay. why, and it was after this accident, um, you, yes. you drank that and it was right. very, was it very much because of that? The, the oh yeah. With I that? mean, yeah, because I, I was just in a in a funk. Mm. It took it took me two weeks to sober up entirely, or oh, let, let's say it took me three days to sober up, but it take took me two weeks to get over the hangover. <laughs> yeah. I, can, I can imagine. <laughs> uh, oh man! So anyway, uh, that. Um, You know, that sort of was a rite of passage. Fortunately, I had a professor of Asian history. Um, you know, I, w I was in Japan um, in high school, um, my senior year of high school, when John F. Kennedy was killed, for example, and also during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And um, so that was interesting. Um, and, you know, there was, you know, I learned what the United States and our president means to people around the world on that occasion, because, um, you know, the Japanese were just blown away that he was dead. I mean, they were, they were thinking that he was going to help them in various ways. And so I would be riding the trains in Japan and everybody was very upset about it. And, mm -hmm. and you know, people in tears and so on. Wow. So that, um, yeah. So what, what age were you around then? And like after this, uh, the I fifth, was the fifth of 17. I was 17. 17. Yeah. Okay. And so Kennedy was killed. And, um, and then, you know, in, during my college years, there was the Vietnam War protests, right? And, um, and so the question is, we were talking about the Bhagavad Gita. The question is, what is your duty in life as a, as a human being and as a man? human being, what is your duty? And it was a very conflicted time because um, on 
when the Gulf of Tan Tonkin incident occurred. Do you even know what that is? Probably not, right? I do not know what that is. Right, okay. So the Gulf of Tonkin incident was, was where, um, I think it was two North Vietnamese torpedo bo boats attacked um, the USS Turner Joy, which was a, it is a destroyer. Now there's great controversy about whether that ever actually happened. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, but in any case, it got drummed up in the, in the newspaper and the television that it did happen. And so it was the, the excuse for, for, uh, President Johnson to heat up the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War had been going on for many years, but basically in 1954, uh, Vietnam had been a colony of the French before 1954. Mm -hmm. And um, so it had been occupied by the French. And then Americans got involved in Vietnam. I don't rem remember exactly how, but by 1962, when we were in Japan, my, fa my father's duty at that time when we were in Japan was to be the auditor of Navy audit for the whole Far East. So he was the senior naval officer in charge of auditing activities around the Navy in the okay. Far East. Okay. Multifaceted career then. Yeah. And so, and, you know, basically most of his career was like being an accountant, right? Yeah. Fundamentally. In various forms. In various forms, right. Uh, and so while we were in Japan, he had gone to Vietnam twice. And uh, uh, In, in 1962, he had taken me out on the, on the docks at the Yokosuka Naval Base and shown me a line of ships going out Tokyo Bay. And he says, see that skip? And I said, yeah, dad. He says, that's the Marines. They're going to Vietnam. Uh, and then he says, everybody in the military, uh, has either been to Vietnam, is there now, or is going there. And that was in 1962. Now, officially, the Marines didn't land in Da Nang until um, March the 7th of 1965, three years later. So we were already in a secret war that the American public didn't know about for three hmm. years before that. <laughs> Um, wow. That I know of, I mean, because I had that experience with my father. Yeah. And um, so, you know, I did. And I, so I said, why, Dad? And he said, well, the generals need a war to advance their careers. And that didn't sound like a very good reason to have a war to me, but and especially because I was coming on of an age when I could be drafted or go in the Navy, which I always had wanted to do. I wanted to go in the Navy. And, um, uh, but it didn't seem like a good reason to go to war, notwithstanding. So when the Dun Gulf of Tonkin incident occurred, I had come back from Japan, um, my parents were still there in Japan, but I'd come back and in August of 1964 was this Gulf of Tonkin incident. And among other things that happened was that Lyndon Johnson uh, declared that the deferment for the draft um, for marriage was going to end at midnight this night. And he announced that at like 11 o'clock in the morning. And so that day, all the news reports had 
had couples lined up around the block three times, three times around, waiting in line at courthouses around the block to get married so that they could avoid the draft. And, you know, and I, I said, what? This is, they're just escaping their duty. That doesn't seem yeah. right. And so I was turned off by that. And I was always turned off by the Vietnam War protesters because I, at the time, thought that, um, you know, they weren't prepared to do their duty for the country. And of course, I'd been brought up in the military, so I was steeped in tradition and so on. And so that never seemed right to me. The, the protests for the Vietnam War never seemed right. In retrospect, they probably were right, okay? And, and today, several of my uh, contemporaries who didn't serve, um, you know, I, I think highly of them because they, they behaved as warriors too by, by being demonstrators and by uh, going to Canada to avoid the draft and so on. And, uh, you know, and that took courage also, and, mm. and, and it, you know, was an important point. And I tend to agree more with them today, but it, and that's an anagiodromia, but, yeah. but at that time, I, I wasn't very impressed by it. And all of us were, in my group, my age group, was, you know, the basic thing we wanted to do was figure out how to stay alive. Uh, because so many, you know, two million men went to Vietnam and, you know, a few women, but uh, mostly nurses and that sort of thing. And, and just, so, just to paint that, that out um, a, a, a little bit more. So the draft, you are literally, you have to do this. There's no, you, right. if, if you don't fall into these certain categories, you're, you're, you, you have to fight for your country. You're in the army, yeah. Yes, <laughs> right. So, uh, and so and the draft was, out. yeah, and the draft was the law in the United States until the mid '70s, uh, let's say. Okay, so this was the mid '60s, mm. and um, so everybody was going to be drafted, and we had a war going on. We had five hundred thousand men in Vietnam at one point. Uh, so that's a lot of people. That's a pretty big army. Um, and uh, so we were, you know, all the young men of my age were going to go to Vietnam. Uh, and, you know, if we went in the service. And, uh, you know, that didn't seem like a particularly appealing thing to do. But nonetheless, in my junior year of college, I joined the Marines, the U.S. Marines, mm -hmm. and um, I went to OCS in the summer between my junior and senior years of college, and then on my graduation day from college, I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. Um, I then went to uh, infantry school, artillery school, and Chinese language school, um, which was my way of staying out of Vietnam for about a year and a half um, during the height of the war. Okay, so the war was going on, but by some miracle, I got sent to language school. My roommate from the infantry school, the basic school of the Marine Corps, uh, was killed in uh, April 11th of 1969, mm. um, five months after we graduated from that school. But I didn't even go to Vietnam until more than a year after that. And so I was there from 70 to, uh, from June of 1970 to April of 1971. And um, you know, then, then I thought the Marine Corps would give me a, an assignment uh, as, a, uh, as a language officer. 
because I've been trained in Chinese. And they said, no, he's Conover's going to a major Marine Corps command, CONUS, meaning Continental US, which meant that I was going to be basically an artillery officer. And um, I really didn't want to do that. And uh, so I resigned and took a reserve commission at that point. And I went to law school. So while I was in law school, I got promoted in the reserve to captain. So I decided to keep my reserve activity going. And the result was that I served 20 years in the reserve. Um, and and, uh, and just to, there as well, as, as, what, what was it like when one of your, your friends had died in, in the war was, and then you were sent out after? Well, you know, it's quite shocking. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, what, uh, you know, but, but you have to do your duty, you know, as a man, you, we all have to be a warrior somehow. Okay. That's, that's archetypal in the human psyche that if you're a man you're going to probably have this warrior archetype play through you uh and so you know my friends who didn't go to vietnam um you know it played through them by be, by them being against the war okay they they played through their warrior archetype by politically fighting the powers that be that were sending all these young people to war and mm. and uh, 58,000 of them died more than 58,000 died in Vietnam and so it was a big deal <laughs> you know, it was a big deal and um, and, it, and it's really questionable you know the Revisionist history is that that uh, we ran the Soviet Union out of money during that time, but I didn't start hearing that story until the 1990s. Um, so anyway, I was in a in a hot battle in the Cold War, let's say. <laughs> right. uh, okay, uh, and so so it was from there. It was. Vietnam, and you were you were just about to get into, you you went to Vietnam, and like if you can bring us into what that was like for you back then. You what, what age were you? You're 20 years old, 21 years old, leaving college. No, I was a little older than that. I was, I think, I had my 24th birthday in Vietnam. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. yeah and what I mean, was it, what, what was it like? Like the you know the experience. Like bring us bring us into it. Well, I mean, I was a trained Marine officer at that point. And so, um, you know, I was just doing what Marines do and are trained to do. Um, but I was, because I was language trained and then I was trained as an interrogation officer. So during the first six months I was in Vietnam, I was um, an interrogation officer and a camp commander. A POW camp commander. So, you know, we actually ran a POW camp. <laughs> My unit did. And, wow. okay. and, and, um, but it was nothing like Abu Ghraib, which you may have heard of from um, the early 2000s. Uh, back in those days, we believed in, in the Geneva Convention, <laughs> mm. which, you know, later, later people didn't for whatever reason, for which is a bad idea. But, there's that thing. So, like, we are, we're the, as you said, we're the products of our time. We're doing what we're we're told to do, and, and it's interesting how you you mentioned earlier, you know, duty, and uh, we all have our duty. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I'm I'm interested in what you have to say about you know at what point that you you're, you have to. Well, this duty, and then this this the transcending of your duty. You know what I mean? This the this, so that you can well, yeah, you, not be a not be a robot. Is, is you have to do your duty, and that's and that's yeah. what I mean. 
Uh, you, you, do you know Jordan Peterson? He's from the University of Toronto. So mm -hmm. he's a psychologist. Do you know him? He's a famous yeah. guy. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I don't. Okay. Um, yeah. So you might want to look him up on, on YouTube. Uh, he's quite a famous personality, but. Oh, um, yeah, I, I know. I know him well. I'd like, I've read, um, read his books as well. Okay. So he, he, one of the things he said, he says to young men coming out of school who are nihilist is you got to pick up a load, man. Mm. And, and so that's the duty, you know, yeah. where when you're in college, it's all, all well and good. You're learning how to be a human being and you're learning the rules. Okay. Mm. But when you finish college, um, then you're a human being, then we're problem solving creatures for the rest of our life. Mm -hmm. When you're in college and you're getting educated, fine, you're learning the ropes. You know, when you're born, you're a wild animal and your parents gradually develop you. If into, you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, into being an actual human being, right? Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, the, um, the best way to find, a, I quip that the best way to find a meaning to your life is to get one. Okay? Mm. In other words, um, when you're your age, you've, you've been brought along by various people um, to your point, but now, or certainly by the time you finish college, uh, you have to pick up a load and and uh and that's what jordan peterson says that that's why the bhagavad gita is so important because the bhagavad gita basically from a psychological point of view sounds like Jungian psychology right down the middle for me okay mm -hmm. and so this book the study guide to the bhagavad gita les morgan talks about the 11 themes of the Bhagavad Gita in the back of the book. Okay, so I'll just show you. Well, anyway, theme guide. So he's got, he's got 11 themes of the Bhagavad Gita in here. And when I read that, I said, oh my God, you know what this is? This is, this is the main ideas in Jungian psychology. That's exactly what it is. And so, you know, that's my opinion. Mm. It, you know, Les, who I know slightly, uh, says that I'm projecting on it. And I say, yes, okay, yes, I am. I'm not saying anything about the Bhagavad Gita from a religious perspective, but from a, from a practical psychological perspective, Mm -hmm. it's the rules of the road. It's how you have to grow up. And so the scene in the Bhagavad Gita is that um, there are two, two parties. There's Krishna, who's the manifestation of Vishnu, and there's Arjuna, who's the, the noble, and he's leading one of the two armies that are about to go to war, right? Mm -hmm. And... So the two armies are in their throngs on, on two hilltops and he's in his chariot going down the middle. And basically the Bhagavad Gita is sort of a moment in time where there's this exchange of 700 verses that it ex is exchanged instantaneously between Arjuna and Krishna, where Krishna is telling Arjuna the rules of the road as a human being, okay, as a man, okay, um, and you know basically what we could think of, you know, there may have actually been a, a war. We don't know. Um, you know, there are a couple of places in India that claim that this war was in their location. Could be if mm -hmm. it happened. If it happened, it happened 5,000 years ago. But from a psychological point of view, those two armies represent all the, all the um, uh, 
complexes of the human psyche, both good and bad. Okay, so the army of the good complexes, the army of the bad complexes, and chaos and order. Yeah, chaos and order. And so um, I'll just show you this one thing here. Um, so, so Krishna is the driver. So from it, the Jungian perspective, Krishna represents the self because the self is always in charge. Mm. Right? And uh, let me see if I can find this slide. I have a slide that will cover my point I want to make. Um, it, it, it's a, yeah, it's a, while you're getting that side of it, it sounds like I, I'm being being reminded of, you know, um, Adam and second Adam. Yeah, maybe. That's right. It's, yeah, it's like the, this, this spirit, the, the, the capital F father, and then the, you know, the actual physical father teaching the son. Right. Okay. That's so, kind of so the same sort of lesson happens mm -hmm. in, in this story. And this is a, a Cherokee story um, from you know, the American mm. Cherokee nation. Okay, so the old Cherokee is, has his um, grandson out for a picnic. And he says, uh, there are two wolves that are fighting inside me. And one is good. He's joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, faith. Okay, mm. so that's that's the good wolf. And um, the other wolf is, let's see. The one is that you have it there, yeah. anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, and guilt. Right, okay, so the so the chair, so the grandson says, uh, or the grandfather says, these two wolves are having this fight inside me. And the grandson says, well, which wolf wins? And the grandfather says, the one you feed. Mm. And, and so that's the point, okay? That if you, if you feed your anger and, and envy and all these things, then you're going to live a more difficult life. And so it's sort of the, it's on the order of magnitude of the same sort of le lesson that's in the Bhagavad Gita. And, um, and so if you, if you were to read the Bhagavad Gita and or read, um, read the study guide, to the mm. Bhagavad Gita, which has the the eleven themes of it, you basically get the high points of how to live a good life. Okay, and that's what it amounts to. In other okay. words, Mohandas Gandhi used to carry a pocket Bhagavad Gita with him everywhere he went, <laughs> and so and it's like uh, C. G. Jung used to carry a pocket Bible with him. So okay. I have both. I have both a pack of bag of Gita and a pack of Bible. Nice. Right. I'm, I, I'm reminded of again. The, uh, I, I'm really circling around this idea of the uh, enantiodromia, and and how it was it young? Uh, it was in uh, symbols, symbols of transformation. But two uh, two essays on analytical psychology, mm -hmm. where he talked about how it's a piling up of, of um, libido or psychic energy on one side is, yep. is that's like feeding the God. It's like feeding mm -hmm. gods. And it's like right. in, in that story there, you're which, which side are you feeding? Right. Uh, and it's like the blindness that can accrue when you're, when you're, when you feed only one side and you're not looking at the other. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like that's a po polarization. That is like a, a meta, what, uh, analysis of pol what the polarization is going on in in, in yeah. society. Right. So, um, so my issue was okay. I finished law school. Mm. I admitted to the bar. 
I got a nice job at a big law firm in upstate New York. And uh, I had a daughter on the way. And, uh, you know, if so you met your wife at this point. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we got married at, right after college. Oh, you uh, met her in college? Yeah. Okay. Senior year of college. We, well, we I see. Amazing. All right. And so we got married uh, before I went to Vietnam. And uh, so all the time I was in Vietnam, I was putting a lot of my money into all kinds of things that a young couple would need, like stereo sets and dishware and and uh, uh, you know utensils, mm. various things like that, right? And, and were you 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 were you you were you, were you working throughout college to to um, facilitate all of that, or or how did that work? Well, I did work all through college, but but the but all of that was facilitated by my Marine Corps pay because there wasn't mm. much, not much to spend your money on in a war zone. <laughs> mm. right. So um, anyway, um, but when I started to practice law at first, you know, here I had, I was, had been a active duty captain in the Marine Corps, which is a very responsible position, right? And here I basically was carrying somebody else's briefcase in this big law firm. And I didn't like that very much. So I busted out of it after a year and a half. And then I was stuck with trying to build my own practice, which turned out to be quite difficult. And I had a number of issues that were going on with it. And so I had to earn some money and I ended up doing four jobs at once, four. Okay, so I was, I became the company commander of the local Marine Corps Reserve Unit. I was teaching two courses in business law at a local college. I was practicing law full time and I went back to school to get my MBA. And I remember one time driving up out of the reserve center in Rochester, New York, and I turned to the right and my mind just went blank. I mean, it just went totally blank. And I just had to pull over to the side of the road and close my eyes. I just couldn't figure out where I was going. It was, it was just, it was just like, you know, if you're working on your computer and all of a sudden it goes dead because you've lost power or something like mm. that, it was like that. And, you know, it wasn't dangerous in the sense that I stopped driving, but, you know, I just couldn't think of what I was doing. So I just pulled over the side of the road and I just meditated for about 10 minutes and my brain rebooted and then I could... <laughs> <laughs> then I could remember where I was going, but I, I literally was working for four jobs at that time to, to keep things going. Right. Yeah. And, um, and by that, by that time I had two daughters and, um, and I had a house that I was maintaining and so on. So it was, uh, it was non-trivial. <laughs> mm. And, and so um, when I finished business school, though, I got a job to go to Japan and build a company. And, um, and so I did that for five years. And, Who was that with? Uh, Schlegel Corporation of Rochester, New York. I'm, okay. not sure, I'm not sure it even exists anymore, but at that time it was a big deal in, in various components of in four different industries in in uh, the computer copier industry uh, or the printer industry let's say um, mm. in automotive industry in um, in construction in window sashes and in civil engineering so um, how did you land in there? How did you, how did that come about? Well, um, 
how did it come about? Well, one of my classmates was in business school, had had been assigned to Brazil for five years by Schlegel, okay? And we were in business school together and he said, said well, Schlegel's trying to open a office in Taiwan, why don't you come and talk to us? So that was uh, in my freshman year of business school. And so I went in and got interviewed and I thought I was gonna get the job then and it didn't happen. Uh, and, but it was a natural fit because I'm a lawyer, almost MBA and I spoke Chinese and they wanted to start a company in Taiwan. So, so there, but then uh, I didn't get the job. They decided not to do it. And so 15 months later, when I was in line to get my, um, my diploma, he happened to be ahead of me at line. And he said, well, why don't you call Schlegel again? Uh, you know, they might have some use for you. And so I did. And, and it turned out because of my Japan experience, which had been three years in high school, and you know a limited amount of language skill in Japanese, um, they hired me to go to Japan, and so so I sold my house, picked up my family. My wife was pregnant with our third daughter, and we went to Japan. And so I built a company from zero to about ten million a year in five years um, in Japan. But then um, I, I have to ask, what what age were you there at that um, point with the third daughter along the way? Uh, I was thirty two and uh, thirty two to thirty seven. Okay, and where do you think the, the or where did the confidence come from to be able to do that? Zero to ten million, just take on a project like this. Uh, well, I mean maybe from the Marine Corps. I mean, in the Marine Corps, you know, you're taught to take on a, a mission that's not possible and do it. Right? <laughs> and so, um, you know, I've always been able to just pick up something and, and do it. And so, I mean, that's what this conversation right now is, you know, downstream of 30 years of my studying Jungian psychology, right? And, and getting drawn to that, but that's, that's later, so let, let's go back. Mm -hmm. So anyway, my, after five years in Japan, uh, my wife wanted to come home, okay? She wanted to come back to the US, and she had been home in the US every summer, uh, for all five years, and she'd spent the entire summer, 10 weeks, uh, in, in, uh, with her parents, or with my parents, in the U.S. while I was still working in Japan. And um, so we got back, uh, we came back, um, and the reason we came back was that Schlegel had failed on a project that I was involved in that was quite embarrassing. Um, they had, um, I had sold a project to the Japanese, which was to build flush glazing for um, Nissan automobiles. It was Nissan. And um, And Nissan had a plant in Atsugi, and I had persuaded them. Flush glazing means that the window of, of the car has to be completely flush with the skin of the car, you know, in a very aerodynamic way. Mm -hmm. And so this was in 82, 83, that I sold Nissan on the idea of Schlegel designing that for them. And so, it's a long story how I managed to sell them on that idea, but they agreed to give us a prototype door of uh, 
a new model that they were coming out with in a year, a year hence, and they we sent that door back to Detroit where Schlegel had an office. And the idea was that Schlegel, because we were doing that same work for GM and Chrysler and Ford, um, Schlegel was supposed to design this door for them. Um, so, you know, it was a door that had the, you know, a, a framed window, right? But the idea was that when, it, when the window was up, the window would be flush with the skin of the door, right? Mm. And, and so Schlegel sent this thing back, and I, I didn't see it. It went directly to Nissan, and I get this phone call in Tokyo. Uh, Mr. Conover, we think you ought to come out to Atsugi and take a look at this door. And uh, so I, I went out there to see it, and uh, the, the window wasn't flush at all. I mean, you could have taken a garden hose and poured the water through it. Um, although that's not the metaphor I normally use for that, but mm. it, it definitely wasn't flush, and it definitely wasn't sealed. Okay. <laughs> and so I was furious because I, I had waited... Schlegel had only returned it like eight or ten months late, so they had made N Nissan miss a model year. Uh, that was the other thing. So this, by 84, I mean, I made the sale in 82. It was supposed to come back in 83, but it came back in 84, making, making Nissan miss a model year. And, and so it finally comes back in, like, October of 1984, and it was totally defective, right? And I had sold the project, and so I was pretty angry about it. Mm. So I wrote the chairman a 22-page letter <laughs> about how screwed up this was, and, and uh, he, he sent me a telex saying, come back to Rochester, I want to talk to you. So I went to see him. And uh, he made it clear to me that he wasn't going to make any changes. And I said, well, fine, then I want you to move my family home. And I quit. Not a very good idea, but I did quit. And um, Not a very good idea? No, because by that time I was 37 years old. And what happens is when you're 37 years old, nobody saved a job for you back in, in the main office or any other office. So nobody saved a job for you. And of course, if you quit, you're out of the company. And if you're 37 years old, you can't get hired, okay? Because you're already too old for most hires. And so since I, was 37 years old uh, with the, well, when I was 37, I was unemployed for two years. I, I, my marriage broke up. I ended up moving to Washington with my second wife who I've been married to for 35 years. Uh, and I had been married to the first wife for 17 years at that point. But, mm. um, but, I came to Washington thinking, well, here's a Japanese, Chinese speaking uh, lawyer MBA who's built a successful company in Japan. I ought to be able to get a job, right? Eh, no, <laughs> didn't work that way. <laughs> and so, uh, so I was unemployed for two years. And finally, I managed to get a, because I had been doing some teaching uh, up in Rochester, I was able to get a job at the University of Maryland Graduate School teaching finance. So I did that for two years. And while I was doing that, um, the dean tried to steal um, my relationships in Japan. Okay, in other words, um, he was doing a project that he wanted to involve Jap Japan in, 
and I was very well fixed with people who, um, and so this was like 87 to 89. So 87, I was already, I had 25 years experience working with Japan one way or another. And so I had relationships going back to 1962. And so he wanted to do this project in Japan. So I said, well, fine, I've got frequent flyer miles. I'll come with you and I'll help you get your project going. And so um, I, he and I went to Japan together and then I didn't hear anything. And, um, and it turned out that four months later he went back to Japan, but he didn't tell me and he didn't involve me with my long life, lifelong relationships that were quite close. Um, and so one of my relations came through Washington and uh, he said, uh, well, your Dean came back to Japan, but, um, but he didn't involve you. So none of us would see him. <laughs> so, and what was, what was the idea there? Um, and was this a Dean from your what, the faculty, the faculty? Right. He was the Dean of the faculty of the graduate school in mm. the University of Maryland. And he, and what, the, the project, the, the idea was, was he wanted to take all the credit for building a contract with the Japanese. Right. And why did he want to do that? Just that, so out of curiosity. He wanted the credit for it. Okay. Well, okay. and well, at that time, Japan was being very successful in um, manufacturing and so on. Okay. And, and, um, and so the university wanted a relationship with Japanese universities so they could have inter interchange of students and ah, there that we go. sort of thing. Right. Yeah. And so, um, so anyway, he wanted to steal my relationships and the Japanese don't work that way. Um, and, and so they, they refused to see him. And so he failed and, but then he fired me because he didn't want the word to get out that he had done that. Um, and so I ended up on the beach again. Oh. And so from that time when I was, uh, how old was I? I was 43 by that time. Um, I, uh, you know, at that point, I definitely couldn't find a job. Um, and, um, you know, people just don't, they, they tell you you're overqualified, basically. And I was pretty heavily qualified, so. <laughs> and to put, a, to put a pin in here is, you, so you've been through many, many, you know, cycles, like, yeah, uh, of ups and downs here in your life at, at 43. And right. What, what would you say have been the true lines or, or, the, or the guiding principles or the, or the things that you, the lessons that you've learned well, at the, this point? The lesson is the... The lesson with, is with the breakup or the lesson is listening to yourself and redemption. Okay. In other words, and that's the point of the Bhagavad Gita also. Okay, the the yourself is telling you what you should be doing. You know, your deep unconscious is telling you. And you have to pay attention to it. And so you may get on a on a path that's um, not the right one for you. Okay, for mm. various reasons, you need a job, you have to feed children, or what it, whatever it is. Re reality, reality, mm. and and so you you know one of my le one of my lessons is I always left jobs too early. So. You know, one of my lessons is stick with it as long as you possibly can in whatever job. But very often you get into political debate or whatever with someone. And, um, and sometimes you end up on the outside, right? <laughs> and so when that happens, then you have to reinvent yourself. 
Okay. So what did I do? Okay. I had a student who was a neurosurgeon and he had a sailboat and this is in the fall of 1989 and um just to you were 43 here is, is this at that point when you right. uh, you okay you after the dean after that whole thing in japan after i was fired i was fi trying to figure out what to do mm. uh and uh i was still in the marine corps reserve so I, the Marine Corps had always been good to me to put me on active duty for periods of time so I could earn some money, right? And I had a little money at that time, so I was able to also um, support my daughter somewhat by trading in stocks, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, and so, um, one of my students was a neurosurgeon. He had this sailboat and among other things, I wanted to get back into sailing. And so I asked him if he wanted crew and uh, he said, sure, I always need crew. And so I started to sail with him. So one fine day in October of 1989, he said to me that he had heard Tom Peters who wrote the book In Search of, Ele uh, of Excellence, In Search of Excellence is the name of the book. But Tom Peters had spoken at the Naval Academy here two miles from where I now live. And, um, and he had said that you could get typing uh, done in Taiwan. And so my student who was in the in the MBA program that I was teaching in at that point, um, wanted to see if he could get um, medical transcription done in Taiwan. And meanwhile, I had cooked up that I would do some um, consulting for people. I'd worked out a trip that I could uh, go to Taiwan for 10 days and I'd sell a day of my time to all these different people to look into seeing if I could get connections for people to work with Taiwan. And so I said, well, if you buy a couple of days of my time for this trip, which was to be in, uh, was to go on January 15th, 1990, um, you know, I'll go to Taiwan and see if this can be done. So he said, fine, let's do that. So, um, then I was still active in the Marine Corps Reserve. And um, on the 4th of January, 1990, so beginning my wonderful <laughs> decade of the 90s, um, I was going to my job in the Marine Corps, which was as uh, the reserve counterpart to the head of standards branch of the Marine Corps. So we were actually re writing the performance standards for every occupational specialty in the Marine Corps, uh, military occupational specialty. And my job was as the reserve counterpart. So I had to know how that how this was done in case we went to war, he would have gone off and flown F-18s and I would have been sitting in Washington <laughs> writing performance standards which I learned to do, right? But anyway, um, I was going to work on that day and it, and it was one of these days where there's very light ice on the, on the road and it had warmed up a bit. So there was a thin film of water on this ice, okay? Can happen in Toronto very easily and probably happens often in, in Galway also. So, so anyway, I drive it down to Marine Corps Base Quantico in uniform, and I parked the car, got out of the car, started to walk across the park, parking lot, and boom, I fell, and I slipped on the ice. My foot hit a dry spot on the ice and um, broke my leg. Um, and so that was the last thing I did in uniform in the u.s marines <laughs> oh <laughs> uh, so 
And so that also ended my uh, ability to learn, earn extra money from the Marines too, right? And so, and it was 11 days before I was to go to Taiwan. So it also ended that trip, prevented that trip. Um, and so, uh, but the Marines were good to me. They, uh, because I had done it in uniform on the Marine Corps base, they put me on active duty for six months, which again paid the bills. <laughs> but I had my leg up in a, in a cast. I was casted for 13 weeks. And, okay. uh, and, um, and so at the end of that, um, and they put a prosthesis in my right leg. And so um, at the end of that, when I recovered, I came to Annapolis where this neurosurgeon was living. And I said, well, I don't know what we should do about Taiwan, but, and by that time I had figured out that we should try to do it in India. And, um, but I said, the first thing we have to do is create a business and once we have the business going and know that it's working, then we can look into doing it in India. And so he agreed to that. And so we started to build that business and he stuck with it for a couple of years. Uh, but then he, um, he flaked out of it. And so what was this was, business centered around again? Uh, medical transcription. So it was, it's centered around, typing what doctors say in hospitals. So if you're, if you're in an operation, let's say, somebody operates on your leg, let's say, and so the doctor, as soon as he comes out of the operating room, has to pick up a telephone and call in a dictation. He calls, nowadays he calls a machine and, and the machine records what he says, and then somebody has to type it. Mm. And so that's a medical transcriptionist. So what I saw was an arbit arbitrage opportunity where I could get it done less expensively by sending the voice file to India where it would be typed and come back overnight. Mm. Okay. So we actually started to do that. Um, and, um, what did that look like? It's just the nitty gritty here is, is so interesting because as, as I alluded to earlier, it's just the, you seem to have the confidence just to, to rush and bust into things and, and uh, they, well, they to, happen. You have so to what, see, what, what you is have the detail? You have to see an opportunity, right? You have to see an opportunity. And, and then, but then even starting off, so you, you have this entire uh, canvas, blank canvas of possibility. And then you come in day one. Uh, okay, well, any project, all right, so what are you doing? All right, just, just remember this. Okay, you're going to get knocked off your horse through your mm -hmm. lifetime, okay, one way or another. Mm -hmm. And um, did you ever see the movie The Sound of Music? I have not seen that movie. Okay, well, see The Sound of Music. So in The Sound of Music, um, Maria, who's this young girl who wanted to be a nun, um, goes off and ends up becoming the the mother the stepmother of a family of seven children right mm. and but in the midst of that movie she's having a big fight with the father who later becomes her husband right um but she's having a fight with him and she walks out on him and so she goes back to the mother superior and the mother superior says to her, um, whenever God closes a, win a door, he opens a window. Uh, and, and so that's the point. Whenever God closes a door, he opens a window. And so the point is that when you get knocked off your horse, you have to keep your cool and watch for the opportunities that present themselves and they will, they do. Um, and so in this case, the opportunity was my, my uh, student wanted to start this business with Taiwan. And 
so I got the business started. Then he flaked out of me, so I was on me, so I was knocked off my horse again, but we, we still had the business going, right? And so then a new investor came in, and um, for a time, and, and here's how, how it happened. We, we were one lunging along and this guy that was working for me said, well, what if I, I'd like to write an article about you for uh, the Baltimore Business Journal or something like that. And I said, fine, not only can you write the article, but I'll write it for you. So I did because <laughs> I knew I could write better than he could. And so the article got in this newspaper that had a had a uh, circulation of 35,000 people and from that article I had um, I think it was 18 people calling up wanting to invest in my business and um, one of them said my son is running the largest radiation oncology practice in the world, and he'd like to think about buying your transcription business. And I said, well, where is it? And he says, well, it's in State College, Pennsylvania, which is where the uh, Pennsylvania State University is. And, I, you know, that didn't sound very logical to me. So I was sounding skeptical. And uh, this was the father of the owner of the oncology practice, right? And he said, um, I'll tell you what, if, if I send the Learjet down to pick you up, will you come to talk to us next Wednesday? So I said, well, sure, if my wife can come, because I don't think she's ever had a ride in a Learjet either. <laughs> so... We jumped in this Learjet the following Wednesday, and in two hours, they bought the business and got me out of some serious trouble because I, I was in trouble for not paying um, withholding tax to the Internal Revenue Service. Mm. And uh, so they bought the business out, paid off the IRS, and um, and so then that guy who I used to call Bill Gates East. Um, and he, at the time he was worth about $400 million. And he, he in fact did have the world's largest radiation oncology practice. And he was a brilliant, he is a brilliant guy. Um, you know, he's the kind of guy that, that lights up a room mm. when, he, when he walks in and he, uh, never mind how he did it, but anyway, he built up this business and then he, and he had been the national collegiate champion in speed chess. Okay. Can you imagine? So speed chess is a chess game in 10 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. And so he was the national collegiate champion. That's how quick his mind was. And, um, and so for a period of two years, I flew from Washington, D.C. to State College every Wednesday and worked on building up this business. Okay. Uh, so, and most of the time I went in his jet. <laughs> okay. Um, and, but then, uh, then there was, and so in that process, he wanted to set up business in India, which I had suggested earlier. And so I started to set it up and I made 16 trips to India trying to do that Be between 1994 and 1996 or seven, something like that. And, um, And so I built one production center in Madras. I won't go through all the bloody details of that, but it was pretty bloody. <laughs> I'll, just give, I'll give you one example. Um, 
we were setting up the production center in a building that was being under construction. And literally, they had completed one quarter of the first floor of this building, which was to be a 10-story building. They had finished it, and they had closed off this one quarter, and we took that area and started to operate in it. Now, in the United States and probably in Ireland, nobody would ever let you occupy a building until it was complete, right? Mm. And building inspected and all that. But in India, they literally let us move into this space on the first floor and the building was being constructed around us. And what? One, and one time, uh, one time we drove up to this building and there was a, a mud puddle. And uh, I looked down and what's in the mud puddle about here on its chin was a water buffalo complete with a big, huge horns. But the body of the water buffalo was in the mud puddle. <laughs> outside the office. Right outside the front door of the office. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, I mean, that gives you um, a little bit of a sense of what it was like at that time. And... Um, So the problem was Bill Gates East, my friend Bill Gates East, um, didn't realize that human beings uh, wiggle just a little bit more than chess pieces. Okay, so in chess, the rules are all set, right? You can only make 16 billion moves on a chessboard, right? But the pieces don't change. <laughs> you know, the pieces are fixed and they can only move in certain ways. Well, human beings wiggle more than that, right? And so he had bought all these oncology practices out from all these doctors. And um, basically, um, you know, something happened and they all got screwed, right? And he played some games with the IRS, and so he got indicted <laughs> and, and, um, and my, and so he start stopped supporting my business. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, he, um, the day that he was supposed to report to be formally indicted, he skipped the country. And as far as I know, he hasn't come back. So he's a fugitive from justice. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, so. Have you heard, have you heard from him? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. And uh, um, so anyway, um, so here I was again. I had a business that involved India, but one of the last things that we had done in India was we had decided to build a second production center in 1996. And so I put an ad in the Bangalore newspaper um, to hire a manager to build up this second production center. And I scheduled, and I got a thousand resumes <laughs> sent to me, a thousand. And of those thousand, I picked 15 that that I should interview. And one of these guys comes to me and he says, well, I already have a small transcription company because some of the word had gotten out a bit of what I was doing in Madras, now Chennai. And so this guy, among others, had started a small operation. He had six transcriptionists at the time. <clears throat> and, um, so he and I kept talking and I had, because things were falling apart on the US side, I hadn't been able to get much going, but he kept showing up on my doorstep here in Annapolis. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so he came over four times for uh, different times. Just without your knowledge, just showed up in the door. 
Yeah, more or less. I mean, wow. I might have known he was coming a day before or something. But uh, so then one day he calls up and he says, well, I have a friend uh, here in India. And he wants to have a conversation with you. And if he likes what he hears, uh, he'll finance the business. Okay. And so we had this conversation. He liked what he heard. He came to Annapolis, met me. We worked it out on my back porch in 1998, what we would do and how much money we needed. We did the whole um, budget and everything. And, um, and then we began. And uh, so then he wanted me to come back to Madras to try to f find some other investors, some other entrepreneurs to set up other production centers. And so, <laughs> so the issue was I didn't have any, have the, that much business. I had some business, but he wanted me to create production centers before I had business. And, and, he said, well, it's going to take you a year to train these people in India. So during that time, you're going to sell the business in the U.S. So I said, okay. So, and so the idea was we were going to create four production centers, four. And, and what was happening in these production centers? Uh, initially, just training the, the women to hear medical language and then type it because it requires serious... Um, serious knowledge of, of bodily systems. Process. Okay. okay. And, and how did you set, set it up so that they received these? Like, what did that look like setting all of that up? So then the, the young man who had already started the company in Bangalore uh, created a, a training program, a one year training program. And um, they had me to come over and give a talk about what we were doing, uh, which I did in 1998. And the idea was we were going to find four investors who would invest in their own production center, and then they would pay us to train them, and then we would give them business. That was the idea. And that actually worked out, except we were supposed to get four, but we ended up with eight. To begin with, okay, so we had hired about, I don't know, six or 700 people at this point in India. We were training them, but I had to go get the business here in the United States, which we did. And so in a period of seven years, we went from my back porch to a public offering. We went public in 2005. And, um, and by the time we did that, we had 40, four zero production centers and 6,000 employees in India, 6,000. And in 2005, we were the tech company of the year for Anne Arundel County, where I live. And, wow. and, uh, we had about 200 employees here. Um, and, but meanwhile, what happened was because the investment came from India, um, all the directors in the company, with the exception of me, were Indian. And some of those guys wanted to get rid of me all along. Okay, they were always trying to get rid of me one way or another. Um, and they couldn't because, um, I had the chronometer. Okay, let me explain that to you. Um, in on ships of the Royal Navy, uh, or on ships, let's say for several hundred years, um, the way the captain kept crews from mutiny was by holding the chronometer, because with the sextant. You can figure out where you are by latitude, um, but you can't figure out where you are by longitude. 
by where, where you are on the earth. So only the captain of the ship who kept the chronometer himself knew where they were, you know, during all those hundreds of years of navigation. And, and the way he did that was the chronometer was always set on Greenwich mean time. So the significant issue for navigation was that, um, the chron chronometer was set on Greenwich mean time. And so he knew what time it was in Greenwich and therefore by the, by the sun and, and so on, he could tell, um, where he was longitudinally, which nobody could do. Okay, they, they could tell where they were from a latitude point of view, but not from a longitude point of view. Mm -hmm. and, and so only the captain um, had the chronometer. He, only he knew what time it was in Greenwich. And um, as a result, they couldn't throw him over the side because they needed him, right? <laughs> Every ship's crew was like that. That's how they kept people in, in line for all those years with the one exception of the HMS bounty, right? But aside from the bounty, um, you know, all Navy crews stayed loyal, both in the American Navy and the British Navy because the captain was the only guy that knew where they were. So, so it was like that in my company. I, I knew things that they didn't know and, and couldn't know it would be very impossible and time consuming for them to learn these things. And so as a result, they couldn't fire me. <laughs> what, what were these things like uh, direct in? Well, like, uh, I mean, uh, personal relationships with, yeah, okay, okay. with directors of medical records, uh, for example, um, because that's who you're selling your service to is a director of medical records who's responsible for keeping the records. And so the doctors are dictating, I'm turning it around and giving them back a printed version of what the doctor said and that goes in the medical record right so i had over years developed relationships with these directors of medical records mm. and and so because of those relationships and that that's the main thing right um and they couldn't get rid of me <laughs> Right. Mm. It's like I knew where all the skeletons were, right? <laughs> um, and also I knew where their skeletons were over time, right? Yeah. And so they f couldn't get rid of me. But finally in 2005, they bought me out after we were doing this public offering. So they, they were very fair with me. And, um, you know, they bought me out. In a, in a good way, and I was I was set for life. But then uh, I started to work with Indian real estate in 2005, and um, I was working with Lehman Brothers, which was the oldest investment bank in the country, mm -hmm. 187 years of business, and on September the 15th. 2008, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt and took my life savings with it. Wow. Yeah. And so, uh, so there I am now uh, at age, uh, let's see, when was it? I, I was, by then I was almost 60 and, um, I didn't have a job. My life say, or no, I was 62 in 2008. I was 62. And so, um, I didn't have a job and my life savings had gone down the tubes with Lehman brothers. And, um, so all I had was social security and a small pension from the U.S. Marine Corps, which I had earned over 23 years of service, 
plus I had health insurance, which was because of that service, that Marine Corps service. And so that's my main income to this day is my social security and my, my uh, Marine Corps. But throughout that, I had to maintain my um, equilibrium. Okay, my, my psychic equilibrium, because, you know, each time you run into a crisis, like these crises I've discussed, you know, it's pretty hard for a man to face mm -hmm. the fact that you have failed in some way, right? And, or, you know, you've been stupid enough to break your leg or something like that. And, 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 you know, women have their crises too, whatever they are. And so how do you maintain your balance in that time? Mm -hmm. And so what I did was uh, I got introduced to Jung's work in 1987, first with the Myers-Briggs type indicator. Okay which was trained in every senior school in the Marine Corps that I attended, which was Navy War College, National War College, Command and Staff College, Industrial College, the Armed Forces, and the Center for Creative Leadership. In all five of those schools, um, they taught the Myers-Briggs. And so I studied it up at that time in 87 to 90, let's say. And then in 1990, I came across Man and His Symbols, a hardbound copy of it. Okay, and so this is not that copy, because somehow that copy got put lost. But, but recently I was able to buy three on used books, three copies on used books uh, from Amazon. And I guess I still have two of them. I gave one of them to a friend, mm -hmm. um, but um, so I, for the next year, for the year 1990, including the time when my leg was broken, um, I read the, I read about three or four pages a night uh, to my wife before going to sleep every night for about a year. And at the end of the year, we both felt like we'd had a year of psychotherapy. <laughs> you read, you read to, to your wife, you read young. Yeah. Loud. Right. Okay. Three or four pages, right. Every night. And, and, uh, for men and his symbols, this was, mm. and then in 1993, I think in 1992 or so, um, Clarissa Pincola Estes, who's a, a famous Jungian analyst in Colorado, uh, wrote a book called Women Who Run With the Wolves. And my wife was given that book by my mother for Christmas in 1992, Christmas 92. And so, she put it under the Christmas tree. I picked it up and I wouldn't give it to, to her until I finished reading it. So I read it cover to cover uh, in two days. And, um, and so anyway, uh, in that book, there's a, there's a story called um, Vasilisa the Wise. And at the end of that story, um, it's called A Doll in Her Pocket, Vasilisa the Wise. At the end of that story, Clarissa Pincola Estes does about a 40-page uh, description of um, how women develop their intuition, the steps that women have to go through to develop their intuition, which is a nine-step process, as she describes it. So I read that very carefully. And... At the same time, the Gulf War I was ending, and I was without a job. I was trying to figure out how to get my life in order. And so when 
Gulf War I ended, they came back and they wanted to do a parade in Washington, which I was very much against because I'm not in favor of glorification of the military. I, I think it's fine to serve in the military. Obviously, I served for 23 years, but I don't think we should glorify it and, and make it so oh God. That, yeah, God. Right. So I was very much against this war parade. And so I, I didn't want to watch it on television. Even though I was living in Washington, I could have actually gone to it, but I didn't want to do that either. Mm. So I went for a walk around the U.S. Capitol and trying to figure out, okay, what do I want to do with my life, right? And so, you know, that point in time, um, that was 46 years old and... Um, what I decided was that I wanted to be a writer. And then, then I realized that, hey, I'd been a writer all of my life, but I'd always been writing for other people, both mm -hmm. as, a, as a lawyer and as a businessman. I was constantly writing reports and getting people to invest in projects that I had presented. Um, and so I, I just decided to, that I wanted to be a writer, but I wanted to write a novel. And in, so on that walk, it came to my mind, it, well, um, the guy who wrote Jurassic Park, Michael Crichton, had been interviewed in um, the Wall Street Journal, I think, and, mm. and he said, when you want to write a novel, the thing to do is to ask a question and then answer it. So the question he answered is, what if you bring old dinosaurs back to life, right? Which was Jurassic Park. That was his book that was coming out at that time. Mm. And, and so I'm, I'm thinking about that piece of advice. You know, if you're going to write a novel, ask a question and then answer it. And so... I remember it came from my deep unconscious that there was a question that I had asked my father when I was 15 years old. And when I was 15 years old, we had a, a live-in maid in Japan. She was, I think, 22 or 23, so not that much older than me at the time. And I said, you know, you know, where did Michiko come from and why, why is she here with us, Dad? And so dad said, my dad said, well, um, Japanese farm girls um, come to Tokyo to quote unquote earn their dowry. And uh, so at age 15, I didn't really know what that meant. Uh, but then when I had gone back to Japan and been there for five years in business, I had lots of adult experiences with adult Japanese women, okay? And also with adult Japanese men. And so I had all this experience, eight years in Japan, um, and I speak Japanese. So I said, okay, what... If, if that's true, then what, what would the life of one of those girls be like who is, comes to Tokyo to earn her dowry, but ultimately becomes the first woman prime minister of Japan? That's the question. What would that life be like? Mm -hmm. And um, so... Um, I, s I sat down and I started to write this story and within two days I was possessed by my anima, okay, in terms of Jungian psychology, this was an archetypal possession and I was using Clarissa Pinkola's, Pinkola Estes' roadmap as the steps that she would have to go through, but I literally was 
having visions. And so from the time I, be, let's say two days after I started to write that novel un, until it was done, um, I was awakened every day by this entity who presented as a 15 year old Japanese girl in a beautiful kimono who woke me up every morning at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, and I, you know, saw her in my vision and she was shaking me to wake me up every morning. And I would go into my computer. I would keep my, all the lights off. I would, um, I turned the, screen on my computer down to the lowest possible mm. level so that it wasn't waking me up trying to keep myself in my sort of dreamy dreamy state right mm. and i would put my hands on the keyboard and the novel wrote itself and so in eight months time uh it was written from end to end okay now, my wife, who is a very wise woman, um, refused to read it until I had had 10 other women read it. <laughs> little yeah. did she... Little Why was bit, that? Uh, she didn't want to put the kibosh on my creativity. Ah. Uh. Right? And, and so if she, you know, if she read a passage and she didn't like it, that might shut down my creativity. So mm -hmm. she just let it run and I let it run. I have no recollection of my fingers actually hitting the keys, but I know that I wrote that novel or that novel came directly from my unconscious directly onto the keys and mm -hmm. onto its final form. And so, um, but there was a problem with it. The problem was that it contains, uh, putting it mildly, erotic episodes. And that's being very kind because actually there are some um, pornographic mm. sections to this novel. And so it kind of shocked me. Okay. But and anyway, it was this possession that once the archetype gets playing in you once once that archetype is playing through it doesn't stop until it finishes right and so this was the autobiography of my anima from 1962 to 1993 and um, and so when I finished with it um, I did show it to to various women and they loved it, okay? And so finally, when I showed it to 10 women, my wife looked at it and she loved it. My mother loved it. Every woman I ever showed it to has loved that novel, um, notwithstanding the content, much to my surprise, right? Yeah. Um, and And now that's a number in the hundreds of women that I know of who've read it and told me they loved it. Um, but I was in the middle of my business career and I said, well, you know what, what am I going to do with a pornographic novel? Right. Yeah. And, and mind you, it has a, it has a good ending because, um, it actually ends in the retirement after the heroine who starts at age 15 in 1962 becomes the first woman prime minister of Japan. And, and then ultimately she's retired. Okay. okay. And so the novel has a good ending, but there are lots of things that happen in the middle. Mm. Right. And so I ended up aside from showing it privately to people, I ended up putting it in my drawer and not doing anything with it and always thinking that I would publish it someday. Okay. Um, and finally I decided I would do it when I was 70. Um, and 
actually I did it a little earlier than that, I guess, uh, but Dr. Young's Red Book came out, okay? And I realized that he had had all these visionary experiences over a five-year period. Mine had only lasted eight months. But I said, wow, if the most um, experienced and erudite psychiatrist, psychologist of the 20th century had this experience, then I guess mine was okay too. Okay, but I had, but I went through my experience 16 years earlier than when that came out um, without benefit of being a psychiatrist, mm. <laughs> with, without benefit of being a psychologist. So I, I didn't know what was happening to me. I just knew that it was coming, right? And I couldn't okay. stop it. I couldn't stop it. And so I didn't right, do that, Did that cause tensions within you then of like, what is this? Who am I? Or... or well, it certainly raised a few questions over time, yeah. right? but it yeah. also caused me to do a lot more reading about Jungian psychology over the same period of time. Mm. And, and in that period as well uh, of writing, like over over eight months, was it every day or or what every did day. that look? Every, every day. day. And so so you, were, you, you were out of work at that point, yeah? So you had the yeah, I, I was out of work and. Um, 6 a.m. I would get up and go to the computer and write until nine or so in the morning, and then I three go three hours a day. Yeah. Okay. And, and um, you know, and literally this entity that I was visioning, who I now know to be my anima, um, was waking me up every day, physically waking me up from bed to make mm. me go to the computer and do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did publish it finally it's on Amazon in only in Kindle form because I didn't really push getting a a hard copy form but it's called Mako Memoirs of a Woman okay. and, May, and, May, and it's in my pen name which is uh, David Garrison and, okay. um, and I've told that story um, several times, so you, you can find that story on on my YouTube channel. I've just des described it in various ways. Um, but any anyway, I did publish it on Kindle and in uh, nineteen or twenty fourteen, and um, you know, basically, I give it out to anybody who wants it. Um, and, and so, but anyway, that was a real up close and personal experience of what Jung had experienced. That was my point. Mm. Okay. And up until 2005, I basically had not, other than man and his symbols, I had not read anything that was directly written by Jung. I had written... I'd read many things around him, like um, "Gods in Every Man" and "Gods in Every Goddesses in Every Woman" by Jean Cheneau de Bolin, for example, and um, and many other books about Jung. But I had never read Jung because I had the mistaken mistaken impression that his work was about clinical psychology. Uh, which it is not. <laughs> and, and so then in 2005, I wanted to understand something about why he was writing about alchemy, which seemed a little weird mm -hmm. to me. And so I asked uh, Louis LaFontaine what that's about, and he started me off on it. And I started to read Jung directly and realized that he was really writing about religion and culture, okay? And yes, he was a psychiatrist, clinical psychologist and psychiatrist, but what he was writing about wasn't that <laughs> directly. Like he had to write in like sacred whispers, almost, yeah. 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 Is it because is it it, it he, he, didn't, he didn't want to 
appear crazy, essentially. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of motivations. Uh, mm. You know, he was writing about Christianity, um, mm. and uh, he, his father had been a pastor, and seven of his uncles had been pastors, and so he'd been raised in it. And wow. he he was afraid that he was going to cause a hullabaloo in oh, religion. Okay right? And he broke off from Freud because Freud stayed in the, in the logos, in rationality. Yeah. Uh, and his work is all about the right brain, not the left brain. Okay. <laughs> and yeah. the patholo pathology of, of, uh, of man. Right. So his work was entirely about the irrational. Mm. And we have to start thinking about this in a different way, because it's not logos versus eros. It's actually logos against life. Okay. Mm. Because, all right, I'll take any product. Here's a product. It's a book. Here's a product, it's a rubber ball that I squeeze on, okay? Every product, my iPhone, okay? Um, my Sanskrit flashcards, every product has to be created perfectly, okay? If it wasn't created perfectly for, for its purpose, it wouldn't be created. And that is the use of the logos, okay? The logos is um, plans, uh, the written word, um, music on a page, right? So music on a page is the logos, but when the music is then played, that's life, that's in life, uh, right? And so the point is, if you look around your room right now, right where you sit, mm -hmm. except for yourself and potted plants, Everything is dead. There's none of it that's alive. Not at all. Okay. Mm. And so the logos is not about life. It's about a skeletal structure for civil civilization. And, you know, even in the Bible, if you go to uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Okay, mm -hmm. that, and that's where the theologian stopped. Okay, but if you go to um, John 1 4, just three verses later in the Bible, it says, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. Okay, so God started as a word, but it has to be turned into life, right? And so right here, okay, I have a traditional King James version of the Bible. Here it is. So this document is just a black doorstop unless somebody puts life into it. Okay. It's 100% true. I'll, I'll say that for uh, mm -hmm. for another reason. But it's mass. It's just mass unless a gifted preacher preaches from it or it, unless it is the basis of a ritual in a cathedral or a church or what have you. Then it has life in it. But as, as a book... As a black mm -hmm. book, it's just mass. So you have to re you have to remember E equals M C squared. And so we've gone as a species entirely over to the logos following Freud. Okay, Freud was a materialist, who was and he and rationalist, right? But I just want to I'll just show you my classic picture that I show everyone. Okay. So this is a 64 foot motor yacht. And the 
owner has put the correct name on this motor yacht because the name of it is never enough. And presumably this owner has had smaller motor yachts before and now he's got a 64 footer and he's still not satisfied. But oh, by the way, sitting at the dock as it is, it's just dead mass, okay? There's nothing alive about it. And that's why it's never enough. Because if you chase materialism, you're never going to reach satisfaction, okay? And so our president, the president of the United States, is the poster boy for this because he has chased everything that you could possibly chase from a materialistic point of view. He's got skyscrapers that are named after him. He's had three trophy wives. Um, he's now president of the United States. So he's gotten, in the material world, he's gotten everything that he ever wanted, could possibly have wanted. The question is, is he happy? Mm. Okay. So materialism itself does not lead to happiness. You know, your, your neighbor who has a Mercedes in the driveway outside your house um, might be satisfied that he's got a better car than you, you do. But, you know, both cars take you to the grocery store. Both of them require oil and gas and do whatever else automobiles do today. So, you know, if you're, if you're going to be a materialist, how do you, there's no happiness in that. The Mercedes sitting in the, in the driveway isn't helping anything, right? It might make him happy when he's driving it. <laughs> okay. mm. Um, I'm 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 fairly visual myself, and what what I think about is like gold gold lining a dilapidated house, gold lining a rotting house. And it's like it's like that that soul that Jung talks about, you know, matter man in search for a soul. Yeah, and it's it's we're, we're missing we're missing the right. we're missing the soul in the modern society. Uh, I definitely right. feel that in myself, and that's right. I guess that's where this journey has taken me taken me to to this conversation. Right. And so then, uh, let me go back. I, I had three daughters. Um, mm. I left their mother when the youngest was five. Uh, mm. The second one was 10 and the oldest was 12. And particularly the middle one maybe was um, hurt by that the most. Mm. Um, and ironically, she was the proximate cause of it because um, her mother and I had differences that were caused by our, fail our, our failure to transform. We don't, we don't educate our children well in terms of the transformations we have to go through um, in our lifetime. And so while I had moved on, by the time I was 39, she had, she still wanted me to be her daddy. Okay. She didn't want, she hadn't gotten to the point where she could assume the role of a mature mother who's a problem solver. Remember I said, we're problem solving creatures and we have to be able to solve problems all the time. So, um, so, she was at one stage and I was at a different stage. We were never educated about this when we were growing up. And so we didn't have a way to solve it. And we kept uh, arguing because she wanted me to be a small town lawyer and I wanted to have an inter international career, which obviously I did. <laughs> and, and, um, and so we were arguing a lot about that. And uh, on one occasion, we had this, we had this uh, circular staircase in our house. And uh, my daughter sent a note down on a fishing line that said, please stop fighting. And when I got that, um, 
I just knew that I couldn't, we couldn't stop because we, we had had the same argument like a hundred times and it always led to the same shouting match. And, and so basically that was the moment that the, the marriage tore apart, right? Uh, but I mean, it, it wasn't because of my daughter. My daughter was only expressing her angst at the, at the adults in the house screaming at each other, right? Which was mm -hmm. fair enough, right? That's fair enough. Okay, so that same daughter, fast forward 12 years, she's finished college. She's gone to Russia twice. The second time she was there on a USIS graduate fellowship for a year and a half. And when she came back uh, on her 22nd birthday, I took her out for dinner. And uh, we had a lovely evening. Um, and we talked about all the things that we had done together. We had traveled around the world together when she was growing up. And, um, and so, you know, lo a lovely evening, just the two of us. At the end of the dinner, though, uh, the last thing she says to me before I left her was, Dad, I'm sorry to say this to you, but I think you're going to hell. Okay. And so this is religion used as a weapon. Mm. Okay. Now, I don't know what her reason for that was. I mean, it could have been to try to penalize me for leaving her mother. Uh, it could have been to try to get me to be a better Christian. I, I can't say exactly what her motive was. But at that moment, I dropped into hell. And um, driving across from Washington to Annapolis that night, I had a vision of Mephistopheles, the one that I had envisioned from Faustus, from reading Faustus. I had a vision of Mephistopheles plopping down in the seat next to me when I was driving at 65 miles an hour on an interstate highway. And so I cut the Faustian bargain, and it was that he could have my immortal soul on my death, provided none of my daughters thought that of me ever again for the rest of my life. And he left, and he hasn't come back. And that was February the 22nd, 1999. Um, but Fortunately, by then, I knew quite a lot about Jungian psychology. I had had my previous vision, which resulted in writing this novel. And so I knew that this was a psychogenic vision that I had had, right? Okay. And I knew that Mephistopheles was, you know, not any random devil. He was the devil from Faustus that I had imagined when I read Faustus in college. Okay, the same, the same guy, so I recognized him, right? <laughs> exactly as I had pictured him from college. Mm -hmm. and, and so I said, now wait a minute, okay, so I'd had this vision, I knew I had had this vision, and so I said, now wait a minute, if, if that can happen to me, then that must be how these fire and brimstone pastors over all these hundreds or thousands of years have scared people back into the church, right? And plus the, you know, the Catholics were going around burning people at the stake and that sort of thing. So there was lots of fire and brimstone in theology in the last thousand years. Um, and so I'm saying, now wait a minute, this is religions being used as a weapon. And then I thought, well, you know, actually, my first ancestor in the New World, my first European ancestor in the New World, was, and his wife and three sons were refugees from the Eighty Years' War. They came to, they came to Manhattan in 1625. They were five of the first 150 European settlers of Manhattan. And 
they had come to escape the 80 years war, which was this lovely war where every Sunday, summer for 80 years, the Catholics would come up to Holland and try to beat the Dutch Calvinists back into the church. And every fall when the harvest was taken, the Dutch would flood their country and the Spanish would go home to sunny Spain. <laughs> and, and this went on for 80 years, right? And um, finally it ended with the Treaty of Westphalia, but that was a war between Protestants and Catholics. And of course, today we don't think of, of those kind of wars. I mean, you you say you were raised in Catholic Ireland, and mm. you know my son-in-law was uh, raised in Catholic Ireland as well, and my daughter was married in a in a Catholic church. It was sort of interesting because the priest was very cool about it, and so during the you know the exchange during the wedding ceremony and the and the responsive reading, the Catholic side could manage to follow along, but the Protestant side had no idea what was going on. <laughs> it's pretty funny. But anyway, the priest was very cool about it. And, and, um, and so, so we're over the war. Okay, we're over that war. But, you know, my thought is, and because I've been spending so much time on union study for so many years, um, you know, I simply want us to realize that what happened was Dr. Young penetrated to the source of all religions. Mm. And since he did that, there's no reason for religions to fight against one another. And so that's why this Bhagavad Gita experience, where I opened to Laurie Patton's version of the Bhagavad Gita, and here's Krishna describing himself, which is the self, in Jungian psychology. So you can imagine these two armies as armies of complexes that are in the psyche, and, and you know, you're being driven by, by the self, which is... Um, for all intents and purposes, God. And, the knower. Pardon? The knower. The knower, right. The driver, the, 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 uh, what Dr. Edinger called the greater personality. So on all those Bhagavad Gita readings that we've done, I put a link to Edinger's uh, uh, talk where he explains this and the fact that, that Jung penetrated to the source of all religions. Mm -hmm. And once you've done that, then the, all the religions don't need to fight against one another anymore. I, I, just just to, to get an idea there, and just to flesh that out. It, so, so it's like the source of all religions, say all, all, all cultures, all the same stories seem to have repeated themselves like throughout the world, like Dr. Right. Joseph Campbell's work. Right. Uh, and it, then it's it's man's inhumanity that that or, or man's uh, ignorance or whatever it is. Um, well, that, it's, it, I mean, look, be, you know, before the twentieth century, really, the the world was a big place, and so everybody, you know, built their house, their county, their country, and put walls around it and said, this mm. is my place, right? And, you know, so that's all well and good, but then we get up to a world war and we get up to the possibility of destroying the, the species entirely. And then we better understand what it is that's in our heart, okay? What, what it is that is driving us as a species, because in the end, at bottom, all the religions are the same, and um, you know, in in you know, grand in a grand way, they all contain the basic same tenets, mm. and you know, with you know some 
some differences. So if I look at it now, I say, okay, so before everybody was using their religion to protect their territory in part and using it as a weapon in various ways, which they were, that's what all these wars are about. And, um, and so they, they were t turning their back on one another. And so that's all discernment. How am I different from this guy, right? And so the result in the Protestant churches is we have 400 different denominations, 400, more than. And, and there's five in the Catholic side, I believe. And so um, the point is we don't need that anymore we can, instead of having our backs turned to one another, we can turn back toward one another and say, okay, how are we all the same? Number one, how are we all the same? What are the, what are the things that this religion has that every other religion has too, okay? And then to the extent there are differences, what are good differences and what are bad differences, okay? And, you know, should this bad difference continue on? Mm. And, and so, you know, these, the issues that I'm talking about with you now are colossal, species-wide, multicultural, political questions that have troubled our species since the beginning of consciousness. It's way more dangerous now, though, with the, with, way like, more, with the weapons. Right, and way more dangerous with thermonuclear weapons. And so... Um, and what do, you, what do you feel like... What do you feel like will come of that? Or what do you think that... It, 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 what do you think that it is that is preventing uh, people from that turning toward each other? Well, um, first of all, all the pastors and ministers um, and rabbis have a rice bowl that they have to protect. Protect, you know, they're all they all want to protect their congregation and and keep their congregations together because that's who's paying their for their work. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they have an incentive to keep them separate so they could say, well, you can say whatever you want about those guys, but we're different, you know, <laughs> and we're better than them, you know, and, and so in that way, religions are used as a weapon. And so we, what we have to do is get everybody to put their swords back in their sheaths and start working on the pro project of the human species. Okay, so the way I've put it um, is that humans are going into, and the way Jung put it, is that humans are going into a new stage of consciousness. Okay? Mm. So there's actually seven, but let me go through the, the key five ones first. And all human beings go through these, okay? At le except number five. And a few select people are at number five, but let's talk about them. So the first one is um, participation mystique. So when you're born, you're a wild animal. What do you, what do you, how do you learn? You learn by monkey see, monkey do. Whatever mother does, I'll do, okay? And so, you're, you're just in the flow of the family, right? And when you're about three, you start to develop enough of an ego so that um, you say no, okay? When the child says no for the first time, that indicates that their ego has differentiated enough from the parents mm. so that they're a distinct individual, correct? Okay, so then um, second stage is 
your parents are your gods, okay? So you're still small, you're three years old, and <laughs> you still are dependent upon them for your food, right? And so your parents are your gods. Okay, so then you get up into, um, into your teenage years, let's say, and you're taught, or late childhood or early teen years, uh, you're taught a cultural religion, whatever it is. And so now the, the gods aren't your parents, the gods are out there somewhere, okay? And that's intermediated by ministers, rabbis, mm. priests, et cetera. The initiation ceremonies. Right. And so, so there... Is that the, is that the transition from... That's the transition from the, the spiritual fa- the physical father to the spiritual father. Right. So, you know, okay. Right. Okay. So that was all well and good for about 1500 years. I worked really nicely, but then, um, you know, Galileo looked through his, his, uh, telescope and he realized that the earth, um, goes around the sun instead of vice versa. And he said so. And the, the inquisition ran him up before a court and he had to swear on a Bible that the, that the sun orbits the earth and not the other way around, which he did. He gladly did. And his, because he knew he was making that core monkeys for all time going forward. He knew what he okay. saw. Right. And so the result was he was never allowed to look through a telescope again in his life. And because he was also already blind, that didn't probably matter to him too much um, because he'd been staring at the sun, <laughs> but he invented quantum physics. <laughs> you know, in the last four years of his life, he, he invented quantum physics and one other uh, science. Um, so that was in 1519, I think. And so since then, the scientific method has punched holes in all the religious myths, mm. okay? And, and so now we can see back to the Big Bang and we can see down to the quark uh, or the Higgs boson and there is no God in either place, okay? So the way, um, the, way the unions say this is, uh, God fell off the roof of the cathedral and into the human psyche. And then we realize that God is in here. It's in the, God is in our heart, not in physical space. And so Jung said this explicitly in answer to Job, paragraph 752 where he said that every religious statement of whatever kind is a statement of the psyche. It's not a statement of the physical world. And, and in the end, that's the, that's the aha moment, right? Because if you get that and what that sentence means, then everything else falls into place. Um, and And so that's why I can say the Bible is 100% true. It's 100% true as psychic fact. And I don't know how true it is as historical fact. It's probably, in terms of oral history, it's probably at least half true as a, mm-hmm. as a physical history, right, of these peoples who did all these things. But, you know, there are a few little quibbles here and there. For example, the exodus from Cairo to Jerusalem took 40 years, but, you know, a marine platoon could cover that distance in six days. So what were these guys doing for 40 years, right? Mm. It's, all, it's all metaphor, is, is my understanding. Well, okay, it's, it's all metaphor. So, so it's true. As metaphor, it's true. Yeah. And so the reason religion works is it's it's through story and narrative it's causing us to transform in our Mm. psychology 
and we need that over our lifetime and and so that's why the the religious cycle repeats every year you know we have christmas every year we have easter every year because there's always some people in the community that haven't gone through those steps that the psyche needs for development okay so that's so now we've got three stages of consciousness mm. right and would that would the protestants and the catholics then you know with the, the protestants they have like a more uh, protestantism is like a more direct uh relationship with with it with the, the, a divinity so in, in that sense would they be almost would they would i don't know what, what that would mean but would that mean they'd be they'd be almost speed speed along this transformation more rapidly and of their own well, accord as opposed to the catholics who see uh catholicism is like it's outside of yourself you know the, the gods that, God. that's a bit above my pay grade okay <laughs> i'm not going to get into the, that i'm not a theologian no okay i'm not a theologian but you know but the abrahamic religions to include islam mm. it are all have a one god okay there's one god okay and um you know christianity is a jewish heresy actually right mm -hmm. and and islam i don't know if it's a heresy but what i can tell you is that the the quran is filled with christian stories okay it has um and cr christ is is recognized as a prophet in the quran um and so um but most people don't know that and so they think oh these muslims are terrible people and they have this evil book but their evil book has the same stuff as the bible has in it largely <laughs> it's like it's rooted up out of it right including yeah. including the christian story i mean including <laughs> the birth of christ and all that stuff is in the quran okay and how, how, and how, how do we parse that ground i cuz i only learned that in the last year man, in my own in my own reading i've i only learned well this how, is how interconnected it all is. yeah i yeah. only i only like uh, but it's it's like you know people get get to 60 people people die without ever exploring this and would just believe in the the dog dogma well, the, but they they're not going to do that that's not going to continue because because we're reaching this fifth stage of consciousness okay. and so let me cover the fourth yeah. stage okay let's do it all right so so the scientific method was busy blowing holes in the christian myth for 500 years right Yep. God was busy falling off the roof of the cathedral and into the human psyche. And so that caused Nietzsche at the end of the 19th century to say, God is dead. Okay. And we have killed him because people didn't understand what God is. Okay. And so Jung comes along in the next generation. He finds the living God, where he lives, and how he goes about doing the work of the Godhead. Okay. And so there's a, uh, also in every one of the Bhagavad Gita uh, descriptions underneath the video, there's a link to my lecture from last October called Finding the Living God. Okay. It's about how you find the living God and what it is. And, and uh, you know, it, it's, you know, God is real. Okay. I don't have to believe I know, but uh, just as Jung said, but mm. until you've had that experience uh, and in that, in that talk, I should, I literally show because I've caught it three times on on film. Once, um, once in still pictures, and twice on video. Okay, where I've actually found my I caught my numinous experiences on video, and so once you've had one of those experiences, 
And I actually have them almost daily because I know what I'm looking for now. Uh, but once you've had one of those experiences and recognized it as God in your life, then you know, okay, then you don't have to believe anymore. You know, you may have to change some behaviors that you're doing, but in terms of, of what it is, you know, it's described right here in the Bhagavad Gita for crying out loud, <laughs> okay, <laughs> in great detail. <laughs> and so, so the point is, humanity has known this for thousands of years, you know, at least 5,000 mm -hmm. years, okay? Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, you have all these folks who want to intermediate, who are ministers and priests and so on, and they want to tell you what God wants. And, you know, maybe that's not you, okay? <laughs> and so that's what individuation is about. That's where, where you come in and decide, you know, you listen to your own self and decide what's you. But so anyway, so this fourth stage of consciousness is God is dead. Okay, that's Nietzsche. God is dead. Um, and the result of that was that we had about 280 million people killed in the 20th century due to these colossal world wars, right? Because... With a lack of religion, we need it. We need it. We need a, a way of construing the world and ideologies that replace religions. Well, that's right, and and politics replace religions, and you know various things, and religions started to be used even more as weapons. And mind you, I pointed the fact that my family is here because of a religious war. So you know it goes way back. America is here because of religious warfare, right? Um, and or America in its current form, okay, let's say. So, so then what's this fifth stage of consciousness? Well, the fifth stage of consciousness is individuation, but it's also looking back at the original religions and recognizing that they have been serving this psychological function. Okay, so then that's this meme. I'll show you the meme that applies to this uh, because it's pretty darn important. For thousands of years, the mind of man uh, was worried about the sick soul, perhaps even earlier than it did about the sick body, the propitiation of gods, the perils of the soul, and its salvation. These are not yesterday's problems. Religions are naturally evolved psychotherapeutic systems in the truest sense of the word and on the grandest scale. They express the whole range of the psychic problem in mighty images. They are the avowal and recognition of the soul and at the same time, the revelation of the soul's nature. Mm. And, and so that's all of them. That applies to all of them. Now, so how do I know this? Well, what I know is that when I was 30, I was uh, a deacon in the Calvinist church in Rochester, New York, or Greece, New York, and uh, the Reformed Church of America church. And um, I was confused about what God is, and I asked the pastor, and he didn't know either. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted him to tell me about, you know, tell me about God. What is God? How do you define that? Give me the shortcut. Uh, and he just couldn't do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in fairness, he was a young guy, but he'd been through theology school and everything. And, um, but what I did know is that when I went to church on Sunday, I, when I came out, I felt better, okay? Mm. My psyche felt better, okay? So it's 
things that happen in religious services and religious rituals which appeal to the other side of the brain. They appeal to life, okay? And they're naturally evolved. And they're naturally evolved over thousands of years. So to say that, you know, if you take Holy Communion, it's going to do this for you and your psyche. I don't think we're anywhere close to that. But I think we can say by personal experience that it does change our outlook in a certain way. Okay. Mm. And going to church on Sunday does change your outlook in a certain way so that you can go through the next week. And that's basically what they were doing. They, they provide psychotherapy. Okay. It's an hour of psychotherapy every week on Sunday morning at 11. <laughs> right. Uh, and so, you know, what they're doing, I can't say, okay, that there's, there's a thousand PhD theses waiting to be written on that topic, what they're doing. Okay. Um, but they're, they are doing it. They're, they are providing this psychotherapy. Um, and and so what we need to do is now go back to the main religions this is the fifth stage of consciousness and um and see what they are doing from a psychotherapeutic point of view and understand them and then rewrite the scriptures you know recast the scriptures according to modern categories of understanding. Mm. That's what Jung called for. He called for it with respect to Christianity, especially Protestantism, in paragraph 754 of Answer to Job. I'm calling for it in all religions because they're all antiquated. And so they need to be... Um, updated updated for modern categories of understanding. That's what, that's Jung's, what Jung believed and Edinger explicated in his mm. talk, right? That's what Edinger was pointing out in his interview. Okay. And, and so that is needed and, you know, that's a multi-century project. So it's not going to be easy, but it, it's what we need. Okay, and and so rather than throw our religions out with the bathwater, I mean, I, I don't know if you're aware of John Verveke, right? But do you know who mm. he is? Okay, Verveke is a, is a philosophy professor up at the University of Toronto, and you know he he wants to have the idea that we can create a new religion by putting up a Wikipedia page and then having everybody put all their religious ideas onto that Wikipedia page and, um, and then magically we'll have a new religion. And it just isn't going to work that way. It can't work that way because that's an artificial religion. And so if there is going to be a new religion, it has to be, um, it has to naturally evolve. Um, and, and so I'm not saying anything about what that is or should be. Uh, but what I do want to do, I show you what happens if you try to analyze a religion. This is what happens. Okay, so this is Seb Sebastian Brandt uh, in the 1500s, okay, mid-1580 or so, so on, he wrote the Hexaticon, Hex, Hexasticon. And uh, so these are pictures of the Apostle Luke and the Apostle John as they're described in the Bible and with all their features, okay? <laughs> and so if you, if, if you, 
pull all of their features together, this is what you get. Okay, and so an artificial religion, one that is not naturally evolved, is just about as good as an artificial arm. You know, mm. you have your natural arm and it can do certain things. If you lose your natural arm, you could have an artificial arm, but yeah, it's not quite so good, right? And it's 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 a religion without the soul. Yeah. Uh, with our life, as you mentioned. Right. Okay. So then there's, a, you know, a couple of more levels that I, we can talk about stages. One is to the six stages to understand that, um, you know, what Dr. Jung said in his letter to David Cox, which is on my website. Um, but basically, uh, let's see. Okay. I have it here. Yeah. He says, um, although all this sounds as if it were a sort of theological speculation, it is in reality modern man's perplexity expressed in symbolic terms. It is the problem I so often had to deal with in treating the neuroses of intelligent patients it can be expressed in a more scientific, psychological language. For example, instead of using the term God, you say unconscious. Instead of Christ, self. Instead of incarnation, integration of the unconscious. Instead of salvation or redemption, individuation. And instead of crucifixion or sacrifice on the cross, individual uh, realization of the four functions or of wholeness um mm. okay so that's sort of the sixth level of consciousness when you can accept that passage from dr Young. and yeah that's very interesting stuff and, and as you said there we we have to reformulate these these old ideas into scripture for the modern times right like so so the point that's, is that's what jordan peterson is is essentially seems to be doing with his biblical series and his yeah after fashion um but he's he's too logos oriented he considers himself to be the savior of the Logos. But as I explained earlier, the Logos is dead. There's nothing alive in the Logos. The Logos is just a skeleton, or the it's the structure on which we build uh, cathedrals or we build cultures based mm -hmm. on this, um, cata uh, you know, structuring going up. So we have built civilization based on on logos, no doubt, but there's nothing alive in it. Okay, the life is on the other side, mm -hmm. right? And that that's where we've missed the boat. We've we haven't understood that it's not about logos. It's about life. It's mm -hmm. about eros and until you understand that everything material is dead, you know, you have to understand that first and then, then maybe it makes you appreciate what you have in your life better. Maybe mm -hmm. it helps you appreciate your spouse or your children in a different way. You know, we need perfection. We need perfect logos. And that's what men, the masculine principle, are particularly good at, right? But as Dr. Jung said also in answer to Job, the paragon of perfection is a monster. Mm. And, and so, and, you know, I, I ad provide the addendum that perfection provides dead things, okay? It pro provides structure, but not life. 
And so if you're going to have a life, then you have to understand what a life is, which isn't that. I hear you. Okay. Perfection so that provides dead things. That's very interesting. Per, uh, perfection provides dead things. Yeah, that's right. And, and so, you know, whatever. So anyway, that's why I'm reading the Bhagavad Gita. But um, then the seventh level of, under, of consciousness uh, beyond that one is a level which Jung questions whether Westerners can achieve, which is to achieve oneness with the energy of the universe, which is achieved through Kundalini. Um, in the in the east among yogis in the east they, they're able to bring their their psychological energy up through the chakras to the point where they're actually connecting with the energy of the universe okay so remember e equals mc squared and so they're connecting with that E, <laughs> if you will. What do you mean by that? I don't, I don't understand that. Well, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. That's Einstein's mm. general theory of relativity, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so the point is that, that we, we are mass also, and if we're going to connect, completely connect with the one, which is, which is God, okay, um, then we need to be able to connect to all of that. You know, as Mich Michio Kako, the famous TV physicist, said, um, every atom in the universe is connected to every other atom in the universe, right? And, and so that's the one. <laughs> and, you know, at the atomic level, that's the one. And, and so, you know, and originally they were all hydrogen atoms, right? And, And so if you can connect to that, then you're in connection with, with um, as close as you're ever going to get to God. The Godhead. The Godhead, right? And, and so that's why Jungians talk about the God image being in the psyche or, it, you know, that when they want to obfuscate, they say uh, the self or the greater personality. But each of us has something that drives us. So then this is what individuation is. What are you meant to be? Mm. Okay, well, I'm very satisfied with my life right now that having this conversation with you for this three hour period is what I was meant to do right now. Okay. And all of my life and all of the lives of my ancestors up to this very moment have led to this moment. This is the eternal moment. Mm. In fact, well, right, just a second, I'll give you the eternal moment here. Let's do it. Okay, so I gave this little calligraphy to all of my friends and family last Christmas time. And it's a quote from Jung. It says, the great thing is now and here, this is the eternal moment. And if you do not realize it, you have missed the best part of life. You have missed the realization that you were once the carrier of a life contained between the poles of an unimaginable future and an unimaginably remote past. Millions of years and untold millions of ancestors 
have worked up to this moment, and you are the fulfillment of this eternal moment. One should take each moment as the eternal moment, as if nothing were ever going to change, not anticipating a faraway future. For the future always grows out of that which is. You must live life in such a spirit that you make in every moment the best of the possibilities. And so what I've done for you today is I've outlined the fact that, you know, I've run into lots of roadblocks in my life in various ways. Um, you know, and, uh, and when you do, uh, you have to make the best of the possibilities from that point on. And that's what individuation is in part. Mm -hmm. So, uh, anything, anything else? Other questions? I'm, I'm, my voice is uh, yeah. for three <laughs> hours. So. Quite a while. It, it, it went by so quickly. I, I couldn't believe it when I looked at the, uh, at the time. But uh, yeah, I do have, like, say, rapid fire questions just for. Okay, just go, go for it. This. Yeah, why not? We'll go for it. So, throughout your life, yeah, just whatever pops to mind when I when I say these. Uh, so it's like, think of the world, the word life changing, and like, what is the first thing that comes to mind, or what is the first book that comes to mind? Uh, well, um, life changing events. Uh, certainly, breaking my leg in the Marines was a life changing event. Mm. Um, in terms of books, um, I think that Answer to Job is definitely a life-changing event. Um, I think that finding the Bhagavad Gita is a life-changing event. And uh, also uh, finding uh, some other uh, Indian sutras about yoga um, are life-changing. You know, they're not, they're not talking about God per se, they're mainly talking about meditation. And, and that's, a, and the reason I meditate is so that I can hear myself, right? Because when I cut off the flow of all my conscious thoughts, blah, 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 then I can actually hear myself think, right? You can get closer to God. You can get closer to God. And so um, getting this book, The Radiant Sutras by Lauren Roche, um, is one example. And um, this is a translation of uh, the Vigyana Bhareva, which is 112 sutras in Sanskrit, which uh, Mr. Roche has translated here. And the significance of it is that um, you can get a straight translation of the, of the Sanskrit, but Mr. Roach's translation um, just sings off the page. It's radiant, it literally is radiant. So let me uh, give you a couple of examples. Elaborate rituals and garish images may be useful in meditation when your mind is whirling with thoughts of sex, money, and power, wandering like an elephant in heat. Go ahead, use these tools, yet no. Beating drums and blaring trumpets cannot summon the one who is already present. I am not a collection of incantations known only to experts. I am not a ladder to be climbed, a sequence for piercing energy centers in your body. I am not to be found at the end of a long road. I am right here. Give me another one that I like here. Okay, this is really late. 
<clears throat> relates to individuation and it's it's um, insight verse number 160 so it's probably means it's number uh, 110 or so in the beginning began about eight of it here here's the sutra friends relatives neighbors people who abide in your village city country be not concerned with their attitudes toward these teachings everyone is discovering the intimate universe in their own way this nectar is here within every breath every desire every transition from waking to sleeping and sleeping to waking. Once you have set out on the path of intimacy with the immortal essence of life, never turn your back on it, my shining one. Never turn away, though every moment be surprising, revelatory, unrecognizable, and full of wonder. Continue to cherish each breath. Live in gratitude for the ambrosia we imbibe in each turning. Outbreath, outbreath to inbreath, into outbreath. And just, what what book was that? This is um, this is the Radiant Sutras. Okay. And and so here's another. Imagine the entire world consumed by flame. Stay steady, do not waver. As fire transmutes form into light, the soul reveals itself to itself as radiance. Mm. Okay. So that what, pardon? Go for it. I was going to say, I have uh, one last question for you. And I okay. think we can leave it there. It, it, right. it is, what have you changed your mind on about in the last few years and why? Um, I've changed my mind about religion, okay, very dramatically, because um, when I had my experience with my daughter and the vision of Mephistopheles, I was furious. I can tell you I was furious that she had been spo spoiled that evening. Um, that had been up until that point such a perfect evening. And then to drop this little bomb at the end of it really pissed me off. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the reason that I got into Jung was to understand what was going on with me, with my vision of Mephistopheles, but also figure out what to do in terms of my relationship with my daughter. And, uh, you know, I've always believed that, I've, that, you know, religion is, has, there has to be separation between church and state. And so I don't want to try to persuade her to believe anything. She can believe whatever she likes and, and I can too. And so can everybody else on the planet. Um, but, um, but as I said, I, w I was furious that people had, I said, you know, who teaches a child to say such a thing to a parent? Okay, I was, that's what I was angry about. Uh, okay. Okay, who teaches a child to say something like that to a parent? It's just really outrageous. And it's using religion as a weapon and it's not appropriate. And, it drives wedges be into families, and it really could have ended my relationship with my daughter if I, if, if she, had, she and I hadn't ri risen above it. It could easily have done that. Okay, and that's what I was angry about. Now, fast forward twenty years, twenty-one years, and I can say that. Um, because of that event, I was forced back into Dr. Young's detailed work to his work about religion. And as a result of that, I'm with him. You know, I saw his 
video where he's asked whether he believes in God. He says, I have no need to believe I know. And when he said that, I said, oh, I know too. So what is it that I know? And so it took me 10 years to work that out, but I did it. And so, and, and that's what's in my lecture called Finding the Living God, which you can find in every one of the descriptions of the Bhagavad Gita. Because mm. I put, put that link in there, and so you can hit that link and go he, here and actually see the experiences that I had, because I caught three of them in pictures, <laughs> mm. one in still pictures and two of them on video. And that's really hard to do. That's re it's very hard to catch a luminous moment. Like it's it's so is that what is that what reflected back on you? Sure. The Godhead. And is that what yeah. you mean? But okay. Absolutely. Right. And you know, the one experience, the experience that involved uh, the blue angels, the Navy Navy F eighteen flight demonstration team, uh, there is no way that that could have been faked. Okay, no way. Okay. The experience that I had was so unique, it could not have been faked at all. There's no, there's no way of that. Because, you know, how, how would I have even timed it in order to do it that way? You know? <laughs> even if I wanted to, which, you know, I ne it never occurred to me to want to. And so when you get hit over the head by enough of those, then you know, okay, you no longer have to believe. And so the point is that the, the process, of what are you called to be in your life? I don't know. I can't say, and probably you can't either. But as you run into these roadblocks, then just stop and wait. And your psyche, your God image, yourself, will tell you what to do next. If you try to fix it, you say, oh, I'm going to fix it. You're not going to do it. You're not going to be able to get there. And, and so I just have taken my life as it came. And so it came to this conversation. I hope it's been useful to you. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, it has been, it's been, thank you so much for sharing your entire story. Like I'm, it's not easy being vulnerable like that, you know, what was it like? Say it again. What was it like to share your experience like that? Well, obviously it's a, always a catharsis when, when you get to tell your story and that's, that's uh, sort of the first stage of uh, psychotherapy. A religious experience <laughs> yeah so it's a it's a kind of it's a kind of psychotherapy and and so uh you know part of what i'm called to do is to share my experiences in a certain way to help others along the path right Be because we all have to get through life and you know if i if i were going to tell you one place where you can Put all this stuff in one place believe it or not i would recommend the mythic tarot okay by juliet sherman burke and liz green mm. okay because uh, liz green is known as a union analyst of quite some import and um i i've been involved with the, the Tarot over many years now, 25 years. Um, and um, I, I just have, have been called back to it because we're going to do an interview with Melissa Townsend, who has also written a couple of books about uh, the Yoga Sutras of Pat Patanjali. Okay. Uh, okay, this is her book. And so what she's done is she's taken every sutra in the Patanjali, which is 195 sutras, and she's done... Huh? 
A sutra. What is a sutra? A sutra is just a verse. Okay. Okay. So, but what it does is she gives a painting for each one, for each of 195 verses. And she's actually done the first half of it. She's got another probably 100 to do. But, but the first quarter, uh, which is 51 sutras, she's basically uh, taught the essence of uh, yoga and meditation and why you should do them. Mm. And, um, and the reason it, her particular work is important is because everything we learn in a phonetic language goes to the left brain, goes to rationalism. But she has not only given a phonetic language and translated the sutra, but she's also given a right brain answer, okay, mm -hmm. which, which is the image. And what I found happening to me when I started to read this in the last week is that um, I could remember all the sutras right through the first 51 of them. I could remember them in order um, because of the, of the imagery, not because of the words. The words are impossible to memorize, but, but because of her images, I could remember, oh, this one's next, and this one's next, and this one's next. And what it does is it shows you what ha it, the, the first quarter shows you the overview of what you're trying to do when you're meditating. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so it's very powerful in that way. And uh, for me, it's especially because I've been, I've been also studying mm -hmm. Tibetan Buddhism for about 25 years and their mm -hmm. approach to meditation is nothing like this. I mean, apparently the Patanjali came from Tibetan Buddhism, but um, originally, or came back through Tibetan Buddhism uh, from Hinduism. And I, I don't know about that, and I'm not a historian of those facts, but, but the point is that this is the best ex explanation I've ever seen about meditation. Okay, okay. And, and uh, so it's the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali mm. by Melissa Townsend. And she's going to speak with us. Um, we're going to be interviewing her next Saturday night, the 11th of July at um, 10 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. Um, the reason that for that time is so that it's convenient for everybody to the West and, yeah. and it also reaches uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Asia. So okay. Beautiful. And just, just to imagine there, you kept pulling books out from like uh, under the, uh, the camera. I'm like, well, what is going on there? And you have like a whole <laughs> lot. Yeah, well, I had, I had to actually buy two lower bookcases in order to, to house them all. But you know, yeah. I had to do that because my, my book collections coming up over my camera level horizons. <laughs> nice. It's all surrounding you there, is it? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, Skip, uh, 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 that's been three and a half hours. They went by so quickly on my end. Uh, I don't know about you. Yeah, well, it goes by quickly. Thank you for listening. Thank you for pushing me along on it. I hope it's useful to you. Oh, it was, yeah. yeah. It was great. It's just he hearing stories, man. And what, what, I keep, what, what I keep circling around is ki killing the myth of the parents is, is what, I'm, what I'm trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> learn, yeah, learn, it's learn, part learn of all aspects. Part of growing up. Part of growing up. You know, that's what kind of what the Oedipus complex is. It's not about wanting to make love to your mother. It's about wanting to stay at home and not have to go out and face the cold cruel world. But you know, that as uh, Clarissa Pincoli's Estes once said in a essay you can find it on youtube called uh or on the internet anyway called uh great ships 
Mm. And the point is that, you know, great ships are safe in harbor, um, but they're not built for that. Uh, you know, they're built to face the, the trial, the slings and arrows of the ocean of life. And we're built to be like that. You know, when at your age, you know, you've only completed it, it might look pretty scary, but, you know, just let it come. You know, if, if something bad happens and, and knocks you off what you're doing, wait five minutes, the, the God image will tell you what's next. And, uh, you know, nothing is the end. And you, you'll see what you're called to do. And so for me, the last 33 years, I've been called to do this. I mean, even though during that time, of course, I was completing a Marine Corps career, uh, taking a company public, <laughs> you know, building a lot of other things along the way. Um, and so, you know, it's, it, it's a way to just, just manage your, your mental health, I th it seems to me. Yeah. And we all need that. Otherwise, we just go crazy. Or we, or we drink too much or we take too many drugs, you know, something like that. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Hope to fix, fix a little corner of the world. Yeah. Uh, that's the first step. That's the first step. But that's what individuation is, is, is being you know, recognizing what you're called to do and then do it until that gets stopped and then do the next thing. And in the end, you might know what your calling is. So okay. this, is, this is my calling for this decade. <laughs> that's it. All right, man. I think that's a, a beautiful place to leave it. But again, thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Lovely chatting with you. All right, take care now. Bye-bye. Yeah, take care of yourself. See you now.